let's be sensitive to uh, the uh, the day that's out there for some folks to enjoy. I don't know if all of us will get to enjoy it, but uh, certainly we had a string of beautiful weather. Let's call the Transportation Advisory Board meeting for June 16th, 2021 to order. It is 12.32 p.m. Let's do what we've been doing lately, and that is to, um, as we call uh, roll, also uh, vote on approving the agenda. So, uh, Jenna Ernst, if you would begin to call roll and uh, see whether folks want to approve the agenda as shown, uh, we'll get that done as a first order of business. Anderson. Bailey. Bailey. Barbara. Here and I. Uh, Sheila Cowpey. Here, yes. Boyles. Here and I. Crimmins. Here and I. Dugan. Here and I. Foster. Here, I. Fox. Present and I. Geisler. Here, I. Patel. I, here. Julani Stevens. Here, I. Hansen. Present, I. Holberg. Here, yes. Hollinshead. Here, I. Jepson. Here, I. Karwaski. Present and I. Keeley. Here, I. Linda Key. Look. Here, I. Look. Here, I. Ewan. Here, I. Uh, McGuire or Mattis Castillo. Trist, I think I see you on. I thought I saw Commissioner Mattis Castillo on here. Oh, there she is up in the corner. Narayanan. Here and I. Petrick. Reich. Present, I. Sanger. Or Lewis. Here and I. Schember. Here and I. Stephenson. Here and I. Tolbert. Here Ulrich. And Here and I. Williams. Here and I. Windshuttle. Aye, aye. Workman. Here and I. And I apologize, Bailey is on here and I. Got it. Thank you, Mayor. Yep. All right. Commissioner, look, I'm really missing that tropical background. I wish uh, you could restore that again some way, somehow. But thanks, everybody. Uh, the agenda is approved. And um, we've got agency reports. I think Elaine asked folks to send them in in writing, and I'm sure they're being disseminated. But I still thought, uh, you know, we've got uh, a little, we've got a good schedule here today. We don't have any action items. So I, I thought I'd just take a moment to run through to see if anybody had anything important from an agency standpoint that they wanted to share with us right after I give my chair's report. And that'll be brief. Um, in in July, first of all, we're going to try to start at noon uh, because of the uh, uh, heavy agenda that we've got, including we've got a couple of uh, guys coming from USDOT. They're going to talk about equity in transportation on the federal level, a guy named Maurice Henderson and another person named Charles Small. And we've got them tentatively lined up for July. So we're going to shift some things around on the agenda to accommodate them. Uh, and so just a reminder, and Elaine will remind you too, that uh, we're going to start that uh, at noon uh, next month. And then um, Elaine's got a tentative uh, tab schedule included in with the regular agenda materials. And Elaine, do you want to comment on that, the reason why you put that in there? Yes, uh, I was letting everybody know, I mean, we've been getting some requests for some topics and we've been shifting them around. Um, just to accommodate some of the major speakers that we're bringing in. As Chair Hovland mentioned, we have two coming in from USDOT for equity and transportation in July. And also we had scheduled Tim Sexton from MnDOT from the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Council. And as a result, we did move our roadway projects that we had planned for July down into October. So we're going to do an October meeting 
um, regarding the regional quarters update plus the statewide multimodal transportation plan, Twin Cities Highways Mobility Analysis, and then the major projects presentations. So as you can see, for the year, we thought we'd just give you an idea of with the regional um, solicitation items also, we've broken them out into different months for information and actions, and we wanted you to have a heads up on the items that are coming through in our full agendas. All right, good, thanks, Elaine. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to report out on quickly was uh, the regional solicitation uh, policy work group uh, that's meeting with respect to unique projects. And you remember that was that group of volunteers from our, our tab. Uh, your chair, uh, Kevin Reich, Peter Dugan, Chris Geisler, Deb Barber, Chris Fredson, Matt Hollinshead, Frank Boyles, Julie Jepson, Mary Giuliani Stevens, John Ulrich, uh, uh, Commissioner Kamadas Castillo, uh, Stan Karwaski, and Debbie Gattel, both commissioners as well. And we've had four meetings now, and the last meeting, uh, we're not going to have a meeting the end of June. Uh, because we're giving the technical people a chance to uh, do some of the evaluation work that we thought was important to do in terms of the metrics and potential uh, scoring too, I believe. Uh, some of the themes that are kind of emerging, uh, the key themes are, uh, you know, when we're looking at unique projects, uh, folks are thinking we want to be reducing environmental impacts, uh, improving uh, racial equity, uh, supporting the notion of multimodal activity or multimodal communities, certainly looking at things like innovation uh, and technology and um, regional significance and scalability is also a topic that's emerged. And then to the extent there can be partnerships and collaboration on items or on uh, unique projects, that's uh, a factor as well. Uh, we did some brainstorming around that, uh, those key themes Congestion was a controversial environmental impact uh, metric, trying to narrow that down a little bit in terms of its meaning. Uh, connectivity and access, access were major themes that have emerged as well from a metric standpoint. Uh, and then as I mentioned earlier, that public-private partnership concept. Uh, so the next step is to get technical input and then we're gonna be meeting again uh, in early July with respect to um, the input from the technical folks and then we talked a little bit about the application process itself and how it uh, would um, coordinate with the re regular regional solicitation process in 2022. And we've, we've got some tentative ideas there about uh, when to, you know, call for the unique projects and, and how to go about um, getting that information in and evaluating it in a way that uh, is consistent with and works with the main uh, regional solicitation process. So that was. That was uh, sort of the uh, a quick overview of the of the fourth meeting that we had. So we'll meet again on July 9th, and then we'll meet as uh, necessary beyond that. Um, and I'll go to agency reports. Uh, Mike Barnes, anything from MnDOT that you want to report out on? Uh, yes, she, uh, thank you, Chair uh, and members. Uh, this is Sheila Kelpie. I'm in for Mike Barnes today from MnDOT. Um, I did send my update to Elaine as well. We have a couple deadlines. I believe Mike shared those at the last meeting as well, but the raise grants are due July 12th and there will be, um, we'll send the link along to you so Elaine will get that to you and Ted letters of interest are due June 25th. Um, other than that, MnDOT is currently working through contingency planning for a potential government shutdown um, that may occur on July 1st. We're hopeful that the current negotiations will result in a agreed upon budget bill, but we also recognize there's lots of unknowns. You know, we're making good, there's been great progress made in the last few days, which leaves us hopeful, but also recognize we're such a large agency that that contingency planning needed to start several weeks ago. Um, and then also will continue probably until we get official notice that something's different than where we're at. So. Again, a lot of uh, swimming and um, paddling very quickly underwater here at MnDOT to make things uh, move along smoothly and meet the customer needs um, as outlined as, as what we do as an agency. So again, hopeful, but you know, there's not much that we have to report on that other than we are working on it. And thank you for all of your support as well. 
Yeah, thank yeah. you, Ms. Colby. Anybody have any questions for Ms. Colby? Mr. Chair, Mark Winchettel. Yes, Mayor, go ahead. Um, Sheila, I, I, I have a question. Uh, I, I think I know the answer, but this is kind of an informational piece too. But so, so if we do have a governmental shutdown, it's my understanding that all construction projects come to a stop and all of the equipment needs to be moved off any of the state sites. Is that correct? Um, thank you for the question, Mayor and Chair. Uh, I offer that there are lots of negotiations and conversations, but yes, um, that we understand that um, the direction we're being provided is because it would be on state, if it's state owned and yes, MnDOT being inspector, uh, we don't have authorization to spend dollars. So yes, we would uh, be at this point, what I know required to stop everything. Yes. So I, I guess my, my comment is for everyone here to really realize what the impact of that means uh, on any of the state projects. That means they have to demobilize all that equipment, take it somewhere, and then they have to bring it, if, you know, whatever it's, when it ends, then all that equipment has to be rebrought back to the sites. So I guess my point is, is that we really need to encourage our legislators to, to pass a, to pass a budget. Um, and it's not only going to affect that, then we all know what it does to parks and everything like that all across the state. So um, I just found out about this construction piece because we've got a big one in Carver County. And that is, uh, to me, it's amazing when I think about all the equipment that has to be moved off site. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Ms. Copey, anything else? No, um, that's it. Thanks, Chair, and thank you, Mayor, for your comment. Yes, it's a. We recognize it will be a huge impact if we need to move forward to give that notice. And so, thank you. I, I appreciate all of your support. All thank right. You. Thank you, Ms. Copey. Thanks for being with us. Uh, Member B1, anything you report out on for MPCA? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, not very much this month. I think I can send a couple bullets to um, Elaine, but um, we just continue to move forward. We're um, putting some grants out for under the VW um, settlement uh, for school buses and on road heavy equipment. Um, so those are just some more details that we are doing each month. We kind of have some more of that. Um, and I'm glad the the previous member mentioned the contingency planning. We're doing that as well as a state agency. We need to do that. Um, we're hopeful that uh, the agreement will be reached here in the next couple of weeks, but um, nonetheless, we have to do that planning. That's right. really all I had. I will, I'll send some details um, to, to Elaine. Thank you, Member B1. Anything for Member B1 from our colleagues on the tab? Mr. Chair, I have a question for Mr. B1. Yes, go ahead, please. I believe you're you're after so, you know the plan for some of that VW grant money is uh, to put in some electric charging stations around the state at various points along highways and in more of the rural part of Minnesota. Is that correct? That is correct. When sure. when that time comes, uh, could you uh, update us on what charging amperage those charging stations that ultimately are when that time comes, obviously are installed. Um, I'm curious for um, just because I'm, I'm learning a lot about uh, <clears throat> firsthand, actually, uh, with a, a business trip with my uh, the owner of the company into Wisconsin, the difference between a Tesla supercharging station, which is a 45 minute full charge versus the other end of the spectrum with something more of an overnight plug in trickle charge, which takes uh, seven to eight hours to achieve the same goal. That seven or eight time speed is a big deal. Um, and so I'm asking questions at our city. Uh, we do have some e charging stations at a city owned uh, parking ramp and finding out, you know, the wattage or the amperage to see how fast. And I believe I, I was told last night at our council meeting that what we installed was um, I would call it a middle ground, not a Tesla supercharger, but not the trickle either. So it, it can charge a car in, in a few hours. Uh, it doesn't take seven or eight, but um, anyway, I'm just curious, uh, you know, there's not a lot of dialogue in all of the e-charging station conversations. 
not a lot of time spent on just how fast these chargers are for those drivers. And I've now spoke with several uh, Tesla owners uh, about their challenge that they're trying to navigate the state on personal or business. And it's quite a, uh, the stories are incredible as far as everyone is basically trying to find a Tesla supercharger and they don't even, you know, they're not even interested in any of the slower chargers because it's too much of their day to sit for three or four hours even instead of 45 minutes to charge the electric car. And uh, the electric car sales are only going to increase fairly exponentially as more manufacturers are introducing models and et cetera. So my, my fear is we have a lot of charging stations installed that hardly anybody wants to use because they're too slow and they end up overcrowding the, the faster or the supercharged station. So just how we plan that, uh, what those levels are would be interested. I'd, I'd be interested in knowing on the front end uh, what the plan is for what amperage uh, and speed of charging that we're going to end up putting in. All right. I think we've got a couple. Member Keeley, I think we've got a couple of folks that can provide some information for you. I think, as I recall, Member B went through the MPCA has a, has a, a statewide graphic on where they're putting them in and the, in the in the power associated with each one of them. And then Member Holland's head has access to a website, as I recall, that uh, can help on that same issue. Uh, Member Bewin? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and for the question and comment, Mr. Keeley. We have already, yes, a lot of our grant money already has been provided for chargers. So I, what I can do um, is go back and, and find out the information. I, I know we have the network map showing where these chargers are being located across the state. Um, I don't I don't know if that is accompanied by the detail on the, the speed of those chargers um, in all cases. So what I, but but we do have that information so I can I can go back and, and make sure we can pull that together for you. I hope you get circulated. You're right great. about the different you're right about the different capabilities of the chargers. There are uh, at least three different speeds um, and um, and that's obviously good information for everyone to have before they head out on the Mr. road. Mr. Chair. Uh, Dan, may I add a comment to uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Bewin? Yes, certainly, Member Dugan, and then we'll go to Member sure. Holland. Oh, oh, uh, Matt, go ahead. If you were there first, go. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask uh, Member Bewin. Um, I have an electric car, and we've been trying to figure out whether we can do trips to Greater Minnesota. So I've been testing a lot of the chargers that have been installed for a while. And I got to tell you that over 50% of the time, they don't handshake and they don't work. Um, I've got seven different applications that map chargers and that uh, offer memberships and various uh, providers of the power to those chargers. And um, what we really need is nighttime charging. That's what we need. We need eyes on the charger so that people are maintaining them quickly, not two days from now, but same day, so that they are really equivalent to pulling into a gas station and filling up with gas. Until we get to that point, we're gonna be having a lot of disincentive uh, for electric cars. And um, I almost wonder whether uh, the opponents of this are uh, rubbing their hands in glee at the trouble we're having charging. So. I hope that the VW money and any other resource we have or we could find will not just address uh, the charging technology itself, but the actual location, whether uh, nighttime charging is possible, whether it's in range of a, of a hotel, and particularly the maintenance. Uh, we need same day maintenance. We need two hour maintenance. We don't need two day maintenance. That just doesn't work. So. I hope uh, ongoing that those issues will be addressed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, thank you, Member Holland's head. And Member Dugan? You're on mute, Peter. Thank you. Uh, following on uh, Commissioner Bewin's, you know, uh, comments, I believe one time, Commissioner, you mentioned that the level one chargers uh, for a hundred mile charge is uh, 120 volts and that's 17 to 25 hours and a 240 volt is four to five hours for a hundred mile charge. Uh, and then there's also a, I believe you pointed out, uh, 
an app called Level 1 versus Level 2 charging and what the differences are. And uh, uh, as a comment, the, uh, the Star Tribune had a uh, front page article, I believe, on business on Sunday about the uh, charging stations and finding uh, finding them and using them and the like. And uh, if, if I may add one more comment, Mr. Chair, with regard to Commissioner Look uh, and his, you know, tropical backdrop, uh, everybody should see the his picture of him in this pool at the Anoka County. What's it called, Matt? The Anoka County Bunker Beach Water Park. Front page of the Minnesota section of the Wednesday, June 2nd Star Tribune. So, Matt, you're, you, you, made, you made the front page. It, that should be your new uh, back, backdrop shot. <laughs> All right. Remember, Keely, did you have anything you wanted to add on there? Or, Member Geisler, I guess we'll go. You might be able to provide some information. Member Geisler. Yeah. Yeah, so Todd, I'll, I'll throw your lifeline here. Uh, on your FAC here, it's saying the minimum chargers being installed for the DC corridors are 50 kilowatt chargers. So if you have a 100 kilowatt hour battery, it takes two hours on a 50 kilowatt roughly to charge mm -hmm. it fully. Um, they are allowing for substitutions to 100 kilowatt charging stations. Um, but just as an idea, as batteries get bigger, you need bigger chargers. It's basically just a bigger pipe to flow through. Um, so it's not amperage, but it's the kilowatt hour, kilowatt voltage that is what you're looking for through the output. Um, amperage will also speed up some charging, but all, not all vehicles can accept the same level of amperage as well. Um, some of them have limiters, so the older and older ones have lower amperage maximum allows versus Tesla's can take quite a bit, which is why the DC fast chargers work so much faster uh, for them and why they're more proprietary. So. But 50 kilowatt and 100 kilowatt look to be the DC uh, fast chargers that are going in under the MPCA stuff program. Thank you, Member Geiser. Member Keeley, anything further that you wish to comment on or uh, inquire about? No, I'm glad we I'm glad we talked about it because yeah. there is and and uh, I heard uh, some very familiar frustrations uh, by. Uh, a member whose name has disappeared off my screen. Sorry, I don't know where you went, but um, who's a, who's a uh, you know an electric car owner? There, uh, that's there. Uh, me, uh, Matt Hollinshead. Uh, uh, Hollinshead, Mr. Hollinshead. Uh, yeah, there are some very frustrated um, uh, electric car owners out there, and I just I'm I kind of get a bad gut feeling that there's a you know a, a problem that's brewing that's going to get bigger and bigger. So while we are at the early stages of the installation and the planning of this, I think it's important to have the discussion about the, uh, the kilowatt uh, level and to ensure that we're putting in the equipment that we don't have to five years now go back and replace with something more powerful uh, because it's just not adequate to support the needs of the e-car community, uh, which is growing quite rapidly as we've seen in our presentations of the past. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's move on now to uh, Carl Kremens at the MAC. Carl, anything to report? Yes, yes sir. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to say that the uh, numbers at the airport are steadily increasing. Uh, the weekly TSA input security input in April was 160,000. Last year was 35,000 at the same time. So you can see it's quite an increase. Our flights for June are estimated to be 100, 404 daily departures in July, 422. So they're predicting 422 flights. In 19, the monthly departures were about mid 500. So we're getting close. I just wanted to mention also, Mr. Chair, that COVID testing sites are open at the airport. What at Terminal 2, the COVID testing site is pre-security so you don't have to be flying in order to drive up and get your vaccination and at terminal one it's post security so if you are traveling you can access uh, a covid site and be vaccinated in terminal one if you're traveling and those are the i think i believe they're using the johnson variation so it's a one-shot deal and other than that, Mr. Chair, everything's pretty, uh, like I say, everything's increasing at the airport. So we're, we're happy for that. It's increasing faster than we thought. 
Yeah, we're happy for all of us as well. Thank you, Member Crimmins. Any questions for Member Crimmins? Uh, I have a question, Mr. Chair. Yes, Member Narayanan. Uh, thanks, um, uh, Carl. Um, what happened to the real ID thing? Is that uh, do we need a real ID to get on a plane now? No, that was put off for another like ten months because of the pandemic. I mean, you can use if you have one naturally, you can use it. But if you don't, they they delayed it again for about a ten more months before you have to have one for traveling. Thanks. Or your passport. Or your passport, but. For domestic traveling, you you can use the you'll have to use your passport after ten months from now. Correct. Yep. Okay. All right. Good. And then, uh, Member Barber, anything to report out on? You've got, I guess, a couple of things. We've got uh, a person who's been working with us that's changing positions at the council. You might want to report out on that as a minimum. Yeah, I do. Um, I have a couple of things, and um. Um, but mostly related to um, changing of some leadership roles at the council. So first of all, we have officially a new regional administrator. So that was um, had been is Mary Bogie, who had been our acting regional administrator over the last year. Um, when she was at dep as deputy, she was deputy regional administrator and CFO. So um, now as she's moving into the full position that regional administrator will be their open positions for deputy regional administrator and our CFO. Um, and then a big one for that affects this committee is uh, Director Thompson is moving over to Metro Transit where he'll be um, a deputy general manager in charge of capital projects. And so um, that position, um, he will be moving over there effective June 28th. Um, he is actually on vacation um, this week, so I, I gave him a very good hard time for missing his last tab meeting with all of us, but we will definitely still see him probably in his new role. But um, for now, um, Amy Venowitz will be stepping in and um, serving in, in that role as an acting role um, starting from June 28th. And then we also have a, a retirement of Vince Pellegrin. Um, he is retiring from Metro Transit. He's been our chief operating officer. So he oversees both the bus and rail operations and he is retiring. So um, look for that position to be opening as well. So lots of things. So, but we will definitely miss Nick, but I'm excited for him and his new opportunity. All right, very good. Thank you. Any questions for Member Barber? Ms. Barber, uh, could you repeat the name of uh, Mr. Thompson's replacement again? Um, uh, right now, um, uh, the position is open, but Amy Venowitz, who um, reports um, often to this committee, to this group, will be um, serving in an acting role starting June 28th. Thank you. Yep. All right. Thanks, folks. And uh, John Solberg, as tech chair, anything you want to report out on? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a, a couple of items for TAB tonight, today. Uh, first and foremost, your information items three through seven have been through TAC in the past couple months. And as uh, you will hear from staff in their report today, uh, TAC was not recommending any significant changes to the information we presented to you today. Uh, again, looking at it and not seeing substantial uh, problems or changes or issues coming out of the regional solicitation. Um, so again, why the minor changes to that uh, staff will bring to you. Beyond that, last month we did have a um, Complete Streets Leadership Academy introduction for uh, entities that would be interested in being a part of that in the cities. I believe there's three uh, entities that will be picked to be part of that around the Twin Cities. Um, your staff at cities and counties should be aware of that and uh, should be bringing that to your attention if uh, they're interested in in, um, in being a part of it. And then additionally, the one item we did have as an action item last month was uh, the TAC recommendation of adoption of the 22 to 25 tip based on the technical aspects of the tip. Um, of course, we know that the uh, public comments were not completely in, but uh, from a technical standpoint, TAC did recommend approval. That concludes my comments. All right, thank you, Chair Solberg. Any questions for Chair Solberg of the TAC? All right, thank you, folks. 
Uh, we've got uh, one item on the consent agenda. That's the minutes of May 19, 2021. If there are no corrections or additions, changes in any other way, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes of May 19, 2021 for the tab meeting. Motion to approve. Second. Keely, and who is the seconder? Crimmins. Crimmins, thank you. Member Crimmins, Member Keeley. Uh, any further discussion? Roll call, please, Ms. Ernst, with respect to a potential approval of the May 19, 2021 minutes for the tab. Anderson? Bailey? Aye. Barber? Aye. Helpy? Aye. Boyles? Aye. Crimmins? Aye. Dugan? Aye. Foster? Aye. Fox? Aye. Geisler? Aye. Patel? Aye. Giuliani Stevens? Hansen? Aye. Holberg? Yeah. Collinshead? Aye. Jepson? Aye. Karwaski? Aye. Keeley? Aye. Sorry. Linda Key? Look. Look. Linda Key, if you can hear, you can put your vote in the chat too if you want. I think he's having trouble. Uh, B. Wynn? Aye. Mattis Castillo? Aye. Narayanan? Aye. Petrick? Reich? Aye. Stanger? Aye. Will uh, Schember? Aye. Stephenson? Tolbert? Yes. Ulrich? Aye. Williams? Aye. Winshettle? Aye. And Workman? Commissioner Workman? All right. All right, the uh, minutes of May 19, 2021 are approved. Now we're gonna move on to the informational portion of the agenda. And we have with us today from Federal Highway Administration, Andrew Emanuele, and then we've got Bill Wheeler with us from the Federal Transit Administration. They're gonna tell us about the, and report out to the tab on the 2020 uh, certification review results that they had. Uh, with respect to the Metropolitan Council and Mr. Emanuele, welcome, and Mr. Wheeler, welcome. Nice to be here. Uh, Elaine, are you going to fast forward these or how does this work? Uh, that okay. would be Greg Ritchie. Okay, Greg will great. advance them for you, Mr. Emanuele, as you direct him. Sounds great. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Andrew Emanuele. I'm a planner with the Federal Highway Administration here in Minnesota. And today we're going to go over the Metropolitan Council's 2020 TMA certification review results. We're going to start at kind of a high level, reminding you guys what this was, and then we're going to get into the results. Oh, can you move, please? For me? Thank you. Some background here. Every four years, Federal Highways and FTA jointly review the transportation planning process for MPOs with over 200,000 in population. So that over 200,000 is where you get the TMA from. They're called transportation management areas as defined by the federal government. In Minnesota, the only one is of course the Met Council. However, uh, Fargo-Moorhead is planning, looks like it's gonna be one when the census numbers come in uh, a bit later in a uh, year or two. A uh, high level look at what the review was, a three month desk review. This is uh, all the federal partners sitting down and going through about every document that uh, Met Council has ever produced, it seems like. Uh, from that, we hone in on where we want to we want to target when we do an on-site visit. Obviously, we couldn't do an on-site visit uh, in this environment, so we did a virtual visit uh, that went off pretty well. And then from that comes the final report uh, that is submitted to a database in DC. Next slide, please. So somebody with, uh, in the federal government got smart and decided to make this a risk-based approach. Previously, it was about 26 items we had to look at. Now we can do it risk based. Uh, you know, we work with uh, the MPO a lot, so we, we have a good idea of what their strengths and weaknesses are. And even from this list here, we focused on some items more than others. Uh, the big ones being the congestion management process, uh, UPWP, environmental mitigation, and then transit planning and a look at the uh, opt out transit providers and their role. Next slide, please. 
So this were our on-site visit that we did uh, with the Met Council. It was a pretty in-depth two-day meeting held virtually. Uh, I've done this before, but I again wanted to thank the Met Council staff for their work putting this together. We had to delay it a couple months because of uh, COVID, and we really it really came together at the end. So special thanks to Dave Burns and Amy Venowitz for putting that together. We got it into blocks so everybody didn't have to sit through an eight-hour meeting. It, it, it went really well. Uh, a public presentation is also required for this. Usually we do it uh, in person. Of course, we couldn't do that. So I recorded a pretty short uh, presentation that went on the Met Council's website for it was there for 30 days. We did receive 64 written comments from that, which is quite a bit for a TMA certification. And most of them went into three categories. Now, the first one being the Met Council structure, which I'm sure everyone on this board has heard about. Uh, transit investment versus highway investment, uh, depending on where you fall, maybe too much money, you think too much money is going to one versus the other. And then transparency and the appearance that decisions are predetermined. So there's, there's some feeling there that uh, maybe these decisions are predetermined before the Met Council goes out to stakeholders. So we use these themes to inform our review and they did get brought up in there and we did respond to them in the appendix of the review. Um, I'm sure Elaine can send it to you. It has been completed for a while now. Next slide, please. So findings, the findings can fall into one of three categories here. It can be either a commendation, which is a noteworthy practice that we like MPOs across the nation to emulate. It can be a recommendation where something's not necessarily out of regulatory compliance, but there's some room to grow in there. There's some opportunity to improve. And this is usually the most common common one you have as a finding. And then you have corrective actions, and that is a failure to meet federal requirements. Uh, if there is a corrective action, that requires that we do an action plan with timelines uh, for getting that complete. And that has to get uploaded to a database in DC as well. So next slide, please. So let's see how they did. Uh, it's a very exciting best part of the presentation, big reveal. Next, uh, first one, commendations, four recommendations, 12, and then the final corrective actions, they were zero. The Met Council had made substantial improvements from the 2016 TMA certification review, so there weren't really anything that really got close to a corrective action here. So uh, kudos to them for that. Next slide, please. Uh, so the result from this was the transportation planning process was certified. Uh, the final report went to DC on 319.21. And the next, uh, the next time we do this will be four years from that date. Next slide, please. So into the commendations. Uh, firstly, we wanted to commend the Met Council for the 2020 TPP update, particularly their uh, thorough public comment response. Now, I believe due to COVID and everyone commenting digitally, they received something like 200 comments, which is, you know, that's really nice, but it's, it's not why we wanted to commend them. It's because in the appendix of the TPP, they responded to each and every comment and included how it influenced their document. So we really like seeing that and we'd like to see more MPOs do that nationwide. That is not entirely common, but we'd like to see it. The second one had to do with travel demand forecasting. Uh, the travel behavior inventory is very thorough. And now that they're getting data updated regularly, it's going to help them stay much more relevant with their travel demand forecasting. Next slide, please. Another one related to travel demand forecasting. Uh, we felt that when the pandemic ha happened, the Met Council made some quick pivots to uh, you know, really look at that COVID-19 and see how it's going to impact travel demand. So they moved their UPWP projects around and, and took a look at that. And that was something we wanted to commend them on. And the final commendation had to do with bicycle and pedestrian planning. The Met Council is pretty well known nationwide for their planning, uh, for their bicycle and pedestrian planning. And looking at the regional bicycle barrier study and the regional bicycle transportation network study, we thought they're continuing to, they are continuing to do a great job with that. And that was something we wanted to get out nationally and have emulated. Next slide, please. So getting into the recommendations, about a quarter, a quarter of the recommendations, four of them went into the unified planning work program. The first one had to do with clarifying and documenting the internal process for project selection. And we know they, they have a process, it's just not documented. We'd like to see it, so we'd like to know why some projects are chosen over the others, just to get away from that, you know, these decisions are maybe happening in a black box kind of, uh, kind of look by maybe someone looking from the outside. Uh, similar to that is ensuring the UPW study names remain consistent. Uh, they did change from document to document, and which made it a little bit difficult to follow when we were uh, reviewing the documents. Number three, improve estimates of consultation project costs. Right now, they're kind of lumped together. We'd like to see them broken out a bit more. 
And then finally, providing a clear link between UPWP projects and the TPP goals. So how do the projects that are selected inform the goals and make those goals, help make those goals a reality? Next slide, please. So I'll turn this now over to my colleague, Bill Wheeler with FTA to handle the next two slides on transit planning. Yes, thank you, Andrew. And um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Bill Wheeler, and I'm a community planner uh, with the Federal Transit Administration in the Chicago Region 5 office. And um, I want to kind of reiterate what Andrew said um, regarding Met Council. Um, throughout this whole process, the, the um, certification review process, they were very responsive. Um, as always, very knowledgeable, you know, um, all questions were answered. Um, as part of the review process, and they made the process just go that much smoother, more smoother. So, um, once again, like as Andrew, I would just like to express um, my gratitude and, and thank you um, to Met Council for that. Um, so, getting into transit planning, um, there were three recommendations, and um, I believe this is probably the first time this has occurred. Um, I've been in this position for roughly 16 years, and I know. All the certification reviews that I've done with Met Council, we've never spoke with the opt-out agencies. So we did that this time. And specifically, we spoke with um, Maple Grove, uh, Minnesota Valley Transit Authority, um, Plymouth Metrolink, the University of Minnesota, and Southwest Transit. And um, kind of based on the information we had and um, our meeting with those agencies, um, this is where these, how these recommendations came about. So um, the first one, is to execute a written agreement with all public transit providers um, that formalizes the role in the planning process. Um, work with the um, public transit providers to establish a regular meeting schedule and to update the council's website to display more prominently the transit providers' um, websites. So, um, as I stated, you know, the federal team met with the transit providers and um, in general, there was concern about their role in the overall planning process. And um, also there were other concerns about just um, transparency in some of the decisions that are made. So um, can we go on to the next slide? And this one is also related to transit. Um, it, it's um, within the tip and just um, being more, um, essentially more transparent in um, how um, funding allocation is um, distributed to the transit providers within the region. So um, I think um, not only our meeting with Met Council, but also the meeting with the opt-outs was very um, helpful and, and helped um, inform the, the federal team as we reviewed um, the information and wrote the report. So um, with that, I guess I think this is my last slide, so I'll hand it back over to Andrew. Thank you, Bill. Next slide, please. So three more recommendations related to the public participation plan. The first would be to evaluate the effectiveness of engagement strategies and update the metrics for improvement where applicable, including periodic establishing a periodic timeline for effectiveness reviews. This is something that is a federal requirement. It needs to be done. The council does have like just above, you know, just above that baseline for, so it's not a corrective action, but they do need to improve the metrics and come up with a timeline for when they're gonna look at the effectiveness and how they're doing, because without that, it'll, it'll just sit there and it'll stagnate over time. With that, you know, the number two, identify an update cycle for the public participation plan. Now, where there's, there's not a federal requirement for your update cycle. However, if it goes beyond, you know, five, six years, it really becomes irrelevant as uh, technology changes so much. And then finally, update the public participation plan to include tribal governments um, and tribal consultation strategies. That is a federal requirement. Next slide, please. Uh, the final recommendation had to do with environmental mitigation. The TPP only discussed mitigation in about one sentence. We'd like them to provide a more robust discussion of, of environmental mitigation strategies. Uh, not particularly with this one, but uh, to consider it moving forward. We'd like the Met Council to get a little more involved in that. And then the next slide, please. So in conclusion, the Met Council's transportation planning process is certified, hooray. Uh, these are only recommendations, so there is no action plan 
uh, tied to this. So that's a very good thing as well. We don't have any timelines that we have to get this completed by. However, FHWA and FTA will continue to work with the council to address the recommendations, which that is already underway. They've already made some progress. And again, the Met Council always does take the recommendations seriously, uh, and I thank them for that. So as I mentioned earlier, the next TMA certification will be due in 2025. And next slide, please. And we will now open it up for questions. Mr. Chair, uh, if it's okay, can I ask a question? Mr. Chair, I think you're muted. Member Dariana, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Andrew. This is uh, this is great. I was curious as to why there were no, uh, why why wasn't it actually a rec like, like a recommendation with an action plan attached to it, as opposed to simply being recommendations. So the, the federal government, uh, the DOT has become really descriptive on how you do these. Uh, so there's, it's really formal when you get a corrective action. It goes into a database and you have timelines and it's uploaded to DC, right? So they really take that seriously. Recommendations, they're not in violation of the federal law. So there, there's not an, an action plan associated with it. However, we, I do work with the council and so does Bill. I'm getting those things rectified, and they have updated me on the timeline that they are going to have to update these things. And Amy Venowitz, uh, she's on this call, I know. She can fill you in with what those timelines are. Um, so I guess we'll leave it there. Let's just say it's not, it's not required, but they're, gonna, they're doing it anyway. Credit to them. Member Nariana, any follow-on? Uh, yeah, I this I think this is a sort of broader question is uh, when is and I don't know if this is a question for you or for the tab itself, but how do we is there a mechanism for us to kind of look at the composition and makeup of the tab itself as part of the Met Council to see, you know, if this body is truly representative of the people of the region uh, and how effective we are being in making sure that the investments we're making are in line with our, our, you know, values. I don't think that's a question for me. <laughs> Amy? Miss, Mr. Chair, I might chime in here on a couple answers. Go ahead, uh, please. First, um, for the certification review, we do plan to have most of those accomplished by the end of the year. There are a couple that relate more to our uh 2024 tpp and updating the tpp so those will be accomplished with the next tpp update and then as far as looking at the ma makeup of the tab um it does get a bit tricky because it's kind of trying to figure out who's whose role that is and i think it would be helpful if tab was interested in having us do that that you gave us explicit direction to do that. We do have a study that's going to be kicking off this year. It's titled Equity Evaluation of Transportation Investment. Overall, it really is a study aimed at looking, looking at our investments and how we invest and whether our processes are equitable and result in equitable outcomes. I would expect that one of the recommendations of that study will relate to looking at the overall makeup of TAB and who is involved in our decision making and who is represented in the decision making. I, you know, I'm kind of guessing at the outcomes of that study, but that would not at all surprise me if that's part of the recommendations. So we'll be coming back to you in, uh, I think, August or July probably not July, but you have a full agenda, August or September to describe the equity evaluation study and the process for that. You've seen it briefly. It's mentioned in the TPP. It's mentioned in the UPWP. We got funding through the Met Council specifically for that study, equity-related funding. And so we are right now in the process of 
putting together a scope of work for the project and it will go out for a consultant response sometime this fall. So that is a project we want to keep TAM involved in and commenting on. Um, it will have a specific policy group that directs the overall work, but TAM will definitely in, be involved at various points. Uh, so that's a kind of long-winded answer for you. Thank you so much, Amy. Sure. Folks, other questions for Mr. Emanuele or Mr. Wheeler? Mr. Emanuele, let me ask you quickly. You had uh, four commendations that you gave for uh, the express reasons. They were on, I think, slides uh, seven and eight. Uh, no, eight and, uh, eight and nine. Um, when you look around the country at various MPOs and you look at the um, does that do you track uh, administratively at Federal Highway uh, the number of commendations to various MPOs around the country on average, or or recommendations or corrective actions? I mean, are we in a in rarefied error, or is it is a fairly typical kind of report? Um, can you help provide the insight on that? I don't know if I I articulated that very well, but. Mr. Chair, members, you did articulate that quite well, and it's a great question when you're looking at how to compare, you know, this to others. We, you know, we don't like to compare, but in some respects, we have to. That's part of the reason the DOT came up with this new database that they have. It's it's quite new, and it does list the commendations, recommendations, and corrective actions in there. So you can go see how many they've received. You can Google, you know, Google but you can search for a particular topic you might have interest in uh, for congestion management. To see like that, and all the uh, all the all the commendations, recommendations, and corrective actions come up, so you can see how many have got. Now, I haven't gone in and searched a bunch of other MPOs, but I, I know for a fact that corrective actions are actually quite common, uh, and we haven't received them this time. So that that's a, that's a pretty good thing. Now, the level of recommendations that's pretty normal. Um, about twelve is you know, anywhere from fifteen, I might see, uh, and then the commendation seems pretty normal. But Bill Wheeler has. Uh, I'm only a minister of several states, so I think I might open it up to him and see what he says about this. Yeah, Mr. Wheeler, any thought on that issue of how we compare with peer regions or peer MPOs around the country in terms of commendations, recommendations, or corrective actions? Right. Well, um, you know, I was going to, if the question was asked of me originally, I was going to say, you know, there is that database that that newer database that exists out there. Now, as far as um, you know, we handle six states. Kind of in the upper midwest um and i also handle a lot of wisconsin um i would say it varies we've never looked at that and, and studied that specific um question that you asked previously but um i would say you know typically in any certification review there's always going to be a, a couple of com accommodations um sometimes there are some corrective actions and um you know, definitely more than a few recommendations. So I think, you know, um, as Andrew said, you know, Met Council, I think it is, does a great job in what they do. So, you know, um, I would expect that they would get a, some accommodations, but yeah, as far as, um, you know, studying it and, and having some information or collecting the data for that, your specific question, I'm not aware that that has been done. Okay, I'm just grateful you didn't say there was somebody in Wisconsin doing a better job than we were. Well, I would, I would never say that, no. <laughs> I don't like All to right. compare them for uh, obvious reasons. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, well, we uh, we know you work for the federal government. We we, we really appreciate your loyalty to the Min to Minnesota yeah. and, uh, and admire sure. the work the council is doing. So thank you. Any other questions or comments relative to this report? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, this is Matt Hollinshead. Yes, Member <clears throat> Hollinshead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wonder where climate change does or does not fit into the certification process, given that uh, I believe there's uh, federal and standards for um, addressing climate change and, and there's certain state standards. There's probably standards at every level of government, I hope. So is there anything to say on that or is that not integrated into the certification process? I'm, I'm looking at <laughs> Mr. Chair, members, this is going to be somewhat of a nuanced answer. Uh, 
Previously, we weren't really looking into climate change was not something in the previous administration we were really to use that term. So we use the term environmental mitigation and resiliency and adaptation in there. So recommendation number, uh, I think it was 12 in the report with environmental mitigation and, and greater uh, discussion of that within the TPP. So that's something we would like to see in the future. Uh, as you've seen with the new administration, there are a lot more environmental aspects rolling out. I expect there's going to be a lot more Obviously, unfunded mandates, but uh, you know things we need to consider when we're looking in the future at, at climate change. So, uh, you know, I'd say stay tuned for that. Um, Bill, do you have anything to add to that? Not really. I'm thinking, you know, with this new administration in, yeah, that might become more of a focus area in the future. You never know. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, thanks for being with us today. Um, and we'll see you next year, I guess. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Elaine, do we have Tom Fisher with us? I haven't seen him. Uh, yes, I'm here, uh, Chair Hovland. All uh, right, okay, good. Welcome, yep. Professor. Uh, so I want to introduce uh, Tom, Greg Ritchie, setting up uh, Tom's PowerPoint presentation. I think all of you are really going to enjoy this. This is information applicable to uh, local environments, but certainly can be extrapolated out to a region, I think, for understanding it. Tom, by way of background, that we've known each other for probably 20 years. He's just a tremendous asset in this state. Uh, he's a prolific writer, recognized as one of the uh, great writers in the field of architecture. He was a dean at the university, he's still there uh, 20 years approximately as a dean, continuing uh, working as a professor, and he's the director of the Minnesota Design Center, where he's the uh, Dayton Hudson Chair in Urban Design. Uh, but one of his areas of interest has been cities. And uh, I saw a presentation a few months ago now that Tom had put together, and he's writing a book right now on the post-pandemic city and so please help me welcome uh, Tom Fisher from the University of Minnesota to uh, give us his observations on what he thinks the post-pandemic city might uh, look like. And I think we'll think about that in a regional context as well. Great. Tom, thank welcome. You. Thanks yeah. for being here with us. Uh, thank you. Uh, why don't we go to the next slide? Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention is that pandemics accelerate us into the future. And at my center, we've been doing research on this over the past year. Um, and it also, they tend to reveal inequities and inefficiencies. And so a lot of what I want to talk about today are really about those two things. There was a, a recent book out on the 10 lessons for a post-pandemic world, which I recommend you read if you're interested in this topic. Um, but I want to speak specifically about what this means for uh, transportation and for the built environment and land use. So if we go to the next slide, just a little bit of history. Um, pandemics come about every 100 years and they profoundly transform our built environment. After the 19th century pandemic, um, we basically moved into what we got to know as industrial cities. Essentially, we had thought of cities as large villages and we still had outhouses and uh, pumps uh, uh, for water in the streets. And after the cholera pandemic, we realized that cities were a different ph phenomenon that required indoor plumbing, sanitary sewers, uh, you know, water treatment systems. And um, that essentially enabled us to build the large industrial cities of the second half of the 19th century. And the same thing happened in the next slide after the uh, 1918 uh, Spanish flu pandemic. Um, and what that did was first, it was a viral pandemic, much like COVID-19. And it was the first time where we started talking about social distancing, wearing masks. But what it also led people to is to want to live in more socially distanced ways and essentially fueled suburbanization and the desire to have uh, privately owned automobiles. And so a lot of the 20th century auto-centric way of living was really triggered by a pandemic. So you can see that these pandemics have enormous impacts, long-term impacts on the economy, how we live, how we work. And so the uh, point I want to make, if we go to the next slide, is the same thing is happening to us right now. Essentially what has happened over this past year is that we have rebalanced the digital and the physical worlds. 
that while we had technology that enabled us to do a lot of things remotely, we were still in a 20th century habit of thinking that to go to work, we had to go to an office, to go shop, we had to go to a store, to go to learn, we had to go to a school. And things at face to face. And so one of the things that pandemics do is they increase our choice. They give us more choices. And going forward, we are all going to have a choice. Do we do something in person or do we do it remotely? And that is a profound impact on built environment, land use, transportation planning. If we go to the next slide. Uh, so just a few data points. Um, you know, 42% of the workforce is working from home. 75% of that workforce wants to continue to do so at least one day a week. What most significantly, 91% of the employers want to give their own staff that kind of flexibility. Uh, recognizing as well that there are some 30% of the jobs that have to be done face to face. So, you know, one of our challenges is we don't create a two a class economy of people who can work remotely and those who can't. However, uh, that is going to go to the next slide is going to lead to a lot of empty office space. And so we're going to need to be much more flexible in how we think about zoning policies. Um, just as the home is going to become more like an office, the office is going to become and need to become more homelike if it's going to attract workers to want to come back to the office. As well, we're going to need to think about offices having other functions, for example, like affordable housing. Uh, next slide. Um, it also, I think, is going to transform the way we think about land use. Um, uh, we're going to be moving bits more than bodies in this economy. And we now uh, appropriate about 30% of our land to the storage of vehicles. Um, and that is almost certainly going to change. And so we probably have way too much parking uh, and probably way too much lane uh, capacity. And I'll get to that in a minute, um, given the way in which people will be working uh, and shopping in the future. If we go to the next slide. Uh, in terms of shopping, uh, we're already overbuilt. We have 10 times the number of stores per capita than uh, other modern economies. Uh, and about 60% are of the uh, businesses are anticipating not to reopen after the pandemic. Meanwhile, you know, the use of online shopping for groceries and other things um, is expected to continue. So next slide. Um, and so uh, this is going to mean if we're going to have vibrant commercial areas, we're going to find need to compete with the digital world. That is probably the main message. The physical world now has to compete. It needs to provide diverse, immersive, memorable experiences. I think personally, we also need to attend to locally owned businesses, local entrepreneurs, because one of the challenges after pandemics and certainly after this one is the chainification that large uh, national chains are the ones that have been most able to survive this pandemic, but we don't want cities that are just entirely um, CVS and Walgreens. Uh, next slide. Um, we're also, I think, going to need much more flexibility in how we allow and let people uh, uh, sort of develop new economic opportunities, more flexibility, fewer restrictions, uh, enabling startups. Um, already more than half of the businesses in America are out of people's homes. Two thirds of the American economy is now coming out of people's homes. And so we have to ask questions, what is a residential district anymore? It's also a commercial and a production district as much as a place to live. Uh, next slide. Um, we're also seeing, of course, a huge affordable housing crisis. You know, the number of uh, renters, 60% of lost income, uh, half a million Americans are now homeless. That's expected to go up. Um, we need 7.2 million affordable housing units that haven't been built. And meanwhile, apartment development is down nationwide. Meanwhile, we're going to have a lot of empty office buildings. And so thinking about how uh, one problem can be a solution for another is, I think, uh, something we should talk about. Next slide. Um, and so I think we're going to need more creative ways to address this. These are two images where we've been working with the faith community and the East Metro and a project called Settled and with um, in Hennepin County with Hennepin Healthcare and a project called Envision to look at strategies around extremely affordable housing uh, with taking a community first approach, which is kind of a new national model for how to deal with extremely affordable housing. Uh, next slide. And uh, we also, I think, really have to look at policies. This is a comparison of American zoning versus Japanese. Now, the Japanese do not have an affordable housing problem. The reason, because they have extremely inclusive zoning policies. In the upper chart, you can see that uh, in Japan, they only exclude noxious uses. Otherwise, in every district, they allow every other kind of use. 
while the American zoning policies, as you can see in the graph below, are incredibly prescriptive. In other words, we do not allow anything other than what that zone actually allows. And so as a result, we have an affordable housing crisis. In Japan, they don't care how big a place you live in. If you want to live in the back of your store, if you want to live in 200 square feet, uh, if you want to live in an RV, that's fine with them. They don't believe the government has the role to tell people how to live. And so they have solved that problem that, that we still very much have. Uh, next slide. Uh, it's also for, apropos of this co uh, committee, uh, really going to affect how we move around. There was interesting research done at Vanderbilt that showed that just a 10 to 15 percent change in telework essentially eliminates rush hour. Um, and so at the same time, we're seeing a shift in the auto industry toward mobility services, toward autonomous vehicles that is going to have enormous impacts on our highway and transportation infrastructure. Um, and one conclusion is we are tremendously overbuilt. Um, and uh, so as, as uh, commuting patterns change, as vehicle transportation technology changes, we're going to see a dramatic uh, shift in the kinds of roads we need and how much. Meanwhile, we're seeing a, a rise in bikes and other multiple modes of uh, transportation. Next slide. Uh, so uh, we've been doing it, uh, we're finishing a third year of a National Science Foundation grant looking at the impacts of autonomous vehicles on our roadways, and they are going to have a tremendous impact. One of the other things that's coincided with this pandemic has been the automation of a lot of things, a lot of work that is dangerous, boring, and repetitive. And driving is dangerous, boring, and repetitive. And so the automobile industry is rapidly moving to an autonomous vehicle platform uh, and toward mobility services, a completely different business model, which will transform the kinds of roads we need um, and allow for a much greater range of dealing with other issues. For example, there are enormous hydrological and stormwater impacts of this new technology as well. Next slide. Uh, as well as thinking about um, how the digital environment can uh, transform and make cities more equitable. Uh, for example, I'm part of a group called Smart North, which is looking at reimagining streetlights to be high bandwidth access to the internet, to every household, providing uh, all kinds of other technological amenities to cities uh, rather than simply just being a street lamp. Uh, so I think looking at our existing assets and how we can utilize them more effectively is another opportunity. Next slide. So finally, just some of our challenges. We have to pay attention to equities. Again, this problem that we, we face of, of potentially creating a two-class economy, we have to really pay attention to our essential workers, make sure that they are adequately compensated how are we going to deal with the vast amount of commercial, empty commercial space and the uh, land use regulations that we're stuck with from the 20th century that are no longer applicable? Uh, and then how do we give high bandwidth access to everybody, which is really the way to participate in this new economy? Next slide. Uh, but finally, I think there are enormous opportunities. Every pandemic creates all kinds of new business opportunities, new opportunities for cities to take leadership. Uh, another way to think about this is we have a tremendous amount of abundance. We have a lot of underutilized land. We have a lot of underutilized physical assets and a lot of human, cultural, and natural capital that we can tap to really do what happens after every pandemic, which is to think in paradigm-shifting ways about what it means to lead a good life. So maybe with that, I will end and uh, happy to take any questions. Thanks, Tom. And you're, you're off um, video. Yeah, for some reason, my, my, I have to go back in and set my camera. It's not allowing me to do that. I, so okay. apologies for not yeah, being on we'll, camera. We'll get I just wanted to yeah. give you a heads up on yeah. that. Yeah. OK. Well, that was a tremendous amount of information to absorb in a relatively <laughs> yeah. short period of time. Uh, and uh, that may have left heads spinning. And um, the questions may not be coming out yet. But I, I would think that um, some of you folks have some things you want to drill down on further with Tom here while we have a chance to have him with us today uh, with respect to the work we do on transportation infrastructure. Questions from folks or comments? And Chair Hovland, as you mentioned, I'm doing a book on this, which will be out early next year as, as well. Our center is producing a lot of material that will be up on our website. So if you have, are you interested in any of this, we're happy to provide more information. Mr. Mr. Chair, Stan Karwaski, I'm a question for Tom. Say it again, Commissioner. Uh, I have a question for Tom, Mr. Yeah, Chair. Yeah, go ahead, Commissioner Karwaski. Um, a good presentation. Um, 
if you're thinking. One of the things I uh, seen you do a comparison of the uh, open zoning, the open allowances of use of land property in Japan versus America. What are some ideals you think you, you we could transition to to make it more affordable by changing zoning? Just some first steps, you know? There's quite a difference between us and US and Japan. I don't think, I'm not sure we can get to uh, the Japan way of life, but uh, maybe there's some practical steps. Yes, that's a great question. I, um, you know, I uh, think that one of the things is to recognize what's actually already happening. In other words, people are already working at home. They are already running businesses out of their garage. They're already doing these things. And so I think it's more a matter that we don't let our regulations get in the way of how the economy itself is adapting to this new normal. And uh, so I think it would be to slowly evolve our zoning policies and our land use policies, but in the meantime, be uh, flexible and open to what people are requesting because it's, they're probably needing to do it in order to survive. Thank you. Mr. Chair? Yeah, Member Hollingshead? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, in the pandemic, we've seen a spike in crime. And I'm wondering if, uh, your uh, uh, project, your study, uh, has uh, intersected with the issue of crime at all. How how policing can be better, and how crime yeah. can be controlled in post-pandemic cities. I, I wonder if that's within your scope, or if you have any thoughts on that. Well, that's another good question. It's not been part of the pandemic work, although um, Hennepin County and the university have. Um, are in the uh, finishing a planning grant and have proposed a, a, a much larger grant to the National Science Foundation to reimagine the 911 system, um, mm -hmm. to basically uh, create a system that is much more adaptable to the kinds of calls that are coming in and making sure that the right people respond to the right calls. So we do think that there's a lot of opportunity to reimagine our whole emergency response system um, uh, to have better outcomes. So we're hopeful it's a million dollar uh, NSF proposal that is being considered right now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Member Hollingshead. Tom, this is Jim Hovland. Um, we just had a conversation at our city council last night about um, our parking regulations, which are probably, uh, they've been in place since the seventies. <laughs> And so when you made the comment that 30% of the land is used, our land is used to store vehicles, but we, uh, if you're in a suburban environment, you, you know, it was designed for the automobile. We don't have good transit yet. Right. Uh, we've got some people using uh, other modes of transportation uh, that are non-motorized. Uh, I'm wondering what kind of a, a transition you see to more uh, logical or practical sort of you, you, uh, regulations around parking, maybe is a way to put it. Yeah, that's another good question. I, you know, the thing is, I think we're already way overbuilt with parking. I mean, we all know that when you see surface parking lots, they're never full, right? So we already have a lot of excess capacity with parking. So my first recommendation is don't build any more parking. Uh, don't do not build another structured parking ramp. We it, because it will be obsolete within 10 to 20 years because the auto industry is rapidly moving to a new business model where they will make cars, own the cars, and offer all of us mobility. And they're doing this because it's more profitable for them and it's much cheaper for us. And uh, but as a result of mobility services, there's going to be relatively few people who are going to own cars. And so the demand for parking is going to drop dramatically in the next decade or two. And so uh, the fact that we're already overbuilt with parking means that we should uh, not keep requiring more of it, try to use up what we have and start to actually plan for adopting some of that land to other uses uh, in the coming decade or two. Commissioner Holberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, good information. I am curious of the reaction on um, the article that came out this morning on Morning Consult titled, U.S. Spending Patterns Signal Commitment to Cars and Gas 
brightening outlook for suburbs. Um, it tracks uh, vehicle ownership, which went from 79% to 84% since January. And there's only two uh, categories that are tracked that shows a reduction in expenditures, one being public transit. Um, out here in Lakeville, we're seeing a housing boom that we haven't seen in decades. And right. just wondering if there's any comments or, I mean, it, it feels like we're kind of, in this group, we're kind of like everybody has a different portion of the elephant, you know, that they see and uh, depending where you're standing, your view of what's happening is very different. And so what do you see for suburbs and yeah. I, mean, I don't know anybody that used to work downtown five days a week that thinks they'll ever do it again. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting. Suburbs and small towns have really benefited enormously from the pandemic and will continue to do so. We are going to see, because people are realizing they can do a lot of work remotely, they are, there are many people moving to suburbs and, and also moving to small towns, particularly if they can get high bandwidth access to the internet. And so this is going to be good for suburbs as well as small town rural America. Um, so yes, I think that, um, you know, again, it's going to give more people options in terms of where they live, uh, how often they have to go into the office. Um, so that's a different issue. I think the, the issue with transportation is really much more what the car industry is doing. And so people will still, there will still be cars that people will drive, will, that will be driven around, but increasingly we will be driven around by them rather than us driving them. Um, we're going through a transition very similar to what we did 100 years ago when we went from horses to cars. We're taking an animal out of our transportation system. It used to be the horse. Now that animal is us because we're the cause of over 90% of the uh, auto accidents. And so uh, autonomous vehicles are cheaper, safer, and cleaner than what we have now and, um, and considerably cheaper. I mean, uh, Waymo, the Google company, is thinking its mobility service company would offer us rides anywhere we want to go for free if we're willing to sit in the vehicle and watch advertising. And so one can continue to own a car, but you could also get the same ride for free. It became, the ec economics become um, insurmountable. Oh, interesting. Mr. Chair? Yeah. Mark Woodshuttle. Uh, here, I, go I, ahead. I, you know, hearing, hearing some of your comments, like 60% of the businesses aren't opening is, um, I guess that's a little surprising to me. 60% mm -hmm. is a lot. Um, yep. I, I don't know if we're focusing more on different areas because I, uh, like the last uh, person that spoke, we're in the suburbs and they're growing growing we still need to have to have parking i'm not talking parking ramps but we still have to have that and sure so to to have a blanket statement saying we shouldn't build parking we shouldn't expand and things like that we're we're such a large area that that's hard to say as a as a blanket statement and i guess i i just have some challenges when i hear that sure we don't have public transportation here we have it we do have it but uh, not to the point that we can take it everywhere we need to go. So, and and about the uh, autonomous cars, I mean, I don't know how far away that is. I've been to some demonstrations on it and things like that. And uh, you kind of speak like it's around the corner, but I think it's a big corner. Um, and I think it's it, it's a ways away. But in the meantime, we still have to be we have to be planning our cities that we have to be able to keep these cars. Where they need to go and where they, you know, sure. we gotta have the storage somewhere. For them. Yeah, yeah, no, oh, absolutely. I mean, when I said that, I meant mainly structured parking. I think structured parking ramps are probably going to um, have to change their use over their lives. I mean, surface parking, parking lots can be adapted to other uses. So, uh, um, you know, uh, also, you're right, suburbs are growing, but, you know, a lot of the businesses that have closed have been local businesses. A lot of the national chains have managed to survive. But if you go into parts of the city, parts of the Twin Cities where it was local businesses, they have really struggled. Um, and so, um, and that 60% was a national number. Um, so I think there are other parts of the country that have str struggled even more than we have in the Twin Cities. But I don't think anybody should be building structured parking unless you design it so that it will have another use in about 20 years. Yeah. Thank you for that comment. Member Hollins had 
Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think I, I saw a recent article, I think it was in the New Yorker, where um, uh, a lot of owning a car has to do with uh, your self-image and your status and uh, um, being able to say, I can uh, go out of the house and go anywhere I want to at any time. Yeah. And I just wonder whether um, the technical analysis that is so brilliant in your in your presentation encompasses the emotional uh, the emotional content of car ownership, which, according to this article and my own thoughts, is is very great. That uh, it's all very well to say we're going to be you know riding around in in driverless vehicles 20 years from now, and we're going to be sharing cars and all this stuff, but does does any of your study address the emotional importance that people attach especially in this country to owning a car that is at their beck and call and that it's a status symbol not just a means of transportation i'm just curious yeah no it's interesting i i did research for the federal government on the history of the auto industry and that transition that we made from horses to cars people had the very same comments back around 1905 1910 they were saying people love their horses they're never going to give up their horses. They have a personal <laughs> attachment to their horses. And by 1920s, most of them have given up their horses. And the reason was, is that, um, you know, cars were cheaper, safer, and cleaner than horses. And it became insurance starts to flip it. In other words, when you have something that is increasingly um, a, a, sh a shrinking pool of high risk uh, members, the insurance rates go up. So nobody is going to take driven cars away from people. It's simply going to become a little bit like owning a horse. It's going to be a pretty expensive <laughs> hobby and that you will probably be able to do out in rural areas. You might have an autonomous vehicle take you out to your driver car and be able to drive it in rural areas the way you do drive out to a stables and ride your horse around. Uh, we'll still have car races the way we have horse races. So car, driver cars won't disappear. Uh, police and, and firemen will continue to be able to drive vehicles. So it's not like it will entirely disappear. It'll just change its role in our economy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Thanks, Tom, for being with us today. It was really a, a thought-provoking uh, presentation, I think. So uh, I'm greatly uh, appreciative of the time that you took to uh, be able to present on the post-pandemic cities. And then would you maybe keep me posted on when your book is finished, because I'm seeing some requests in the chat for how to get access to your book when it's ready. Good. Happy to do so. Thank you, everybody. OK. Thank Bye -bye. you, Tom. All right. We've got uh, Heidi Schalberg up next, who's going to give us a pedestrian safety project uh, overview report that'll take about 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, so I'm Heidi Schalberg, Transportation Planner, MTS, and Project Manager for the Regional Pedestrian Safety Action Plan that I'll give an overview for you today. Um, next slide, please. So just to shift um, topics a little bit from your last presentation, looking at the future more, um, as of right now, um, traffic safety is still very much a consideration for us with people driving vehicles. Um, I just kind of do want to preface this by acknowledging that safety itself um, means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And so for this project, we are focusing specifically on traffic safety, um, specifically on pedestrian crashes, which are of vehicles. Um, and so kind of overall, the goal of this project is to help provide some tools and resources to our local partners to help us to all work toward ending deaths of and serious injuries of people walking and rolling on our transportation system in the region. So we're taking an approach that's using a safe system framework that I'll talk a little bit more about in a few slides. Um, is really a data-driven approach where we're looking at both where crashes have happened in the past, um, as well as what those risk factors are um, in where those crashes are happening to try to take a more proactive look across the system. So some of the outcomes from this project that we are planning for include risk assessment maps for the region from this analysis. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the solicitation one later. We're making a um, recommendation for the pedestrian safety measure in the solicitation through that committee process. Um, we'll be making some countermeasure guidance based on what we're seeing from the key crash patterns in the region and additional policy and programmatic recommendations. Next slide, please. 
just as some context for a reminder of why we're doing this work. Um, so when we look at pedestrian deaths in the state of Minnesota, um, we have a much higher share of um, pedestrian fatalities than we do when we look at all traffic fatalities. So if we just look at all traffic deaths in Minnesota, our region averages about 30% of those numbers, but when we break those out and look specifically at pedestrian deaths, our region tends to have over half of those on average. Um, so it really is um, a role that our region needs to help play to help address this um, at a state level, as well as just addressing the needs that we have within the region. And just to kind of tie this in some ways to some of your previous items, you might remember that every year we come to you to set targets for our federally required um, safety performance measures that kind of set interim targets for um, working toward zero deaths and serious injuries. Um, we do that, but these don't magically um, get achieved, right? This will take intentional focus and action to actually meet those numbers. And so that's part of the framework that we're using for doing this work. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the overall goal is to provide some resources to help us reduce and ultimately end um, deaths and serious injuries for people walking and rolling on our system from traffic crashes in the region. Um, we're using a safe system approach to this work, we're trying to incorporate equity in the work um, and encouraging our local partners to be making roadway and environment changes that encourage and support walking with safe and convenient crossings. And these were some that were kind of built from some of what we had initially heard from our technical advisory group. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, safe system approach. So this is really an approach that's been used internationally and the Federal Highway Administration is really starting to promote this a little bit more through their work across the country um, and is, is the source of the image on the slide. Um, so it's similar to Vision Zero in some ways, if you're familiar with that, um, where it's the view that deaths and serious injuries are not an acceptable outcome for our transportation system. Um, it's really acknowledging that we need to be looking holistically at, at the system and that as humans, we make mistakes. You know, I think your previous presenter kind of acknowledged that um, in different role. And so um, we need, really need some kind of some redundancy and, and layers of safety in this. And this is really where both infrastructure and speeds and our systems um, are really critical pieces to this um, because they can influence behavior of travelers across our network. Next slide, please. The project timeline. So we're working with a consultant team of tool design and Kaskaskia engineering on this project. And we kicked it off last September. And we're working with a technical advisory group in addition to the project management team. And of course, some of these products will be coming through our regular committee process. So we initially did a state of the practice review to learn just kind of other analysis it's done and what other areas have done. We had this initial kind of retrospective crash data analysis. Um, we have kind of the core work. We'll be um, providing more detail on that in the final plan, and I'll be touching on some of the highlights from that in this presentation. We're doing the systemic crash data analysis and network screen. Um, right now, we presented that to our technical advisory group last month and still have a little bit more work to do on that to make it um, a little bit more intuitive and usable by our local partners. And then we are um, taking a recommendation to our technical advisory group next week um, for the regional solicitation pedestrian safety criteria. And then um, pending that would be going to the July funding and programming committee to be working through that regular process. And then this fall we'll be working on the countermeasure recommendations and the other policy and programmatic recommendations with the final plan wrapped up by early next year. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, we've done some look at where crashes have happened and some of those characteristics. So we're using crash data from 2016 to 2019 in the region. We are doing this analysis for the full MPO region. So you'll see on the first slide um, with the findings, it's a seven county metro plus our urbanized portions of Wright and Sherburne counties. Next slide, please. So when we talk about severe crashes through some of these slides, I just want to clarify. So that is looking at fatalities and serious injuries combined. And perhaps unsurprisingly, just considering the populations in Hennepin and Ramsey counties, um, when we look at just how these crashes are distributed across the region, 
Hennepin and Ramsey counties have the highest numbers of both just all of pedestrian crashes as well as the highest numbers of severe crashes. However, one thing that stood out in the analysis is for the other counties, even though their numbers may be lower, um, the proportion of those crashes do tend to be more severe in those counties. Next slide, please. <coughs> So in, in this initial data analysis, we're using some data sets as kind of proxies or stand-ins for other data. And so common across the country, we don't really have good pedestrian exposure data across the region. So one thing we were looking at in this analysis was using transit stop presence as kind of a proxy for where people may be walking. Or, um, and, and also tying to destinations are on there. So for context, across the region, intersections across our system that have transit, a transit stop within 500 feet, um, are fewer than a quarter of all of the intersections. And this was one finding that really stood out to our consultant team when they were doing it. Um, when they were looking at where these crashes were happening, 80% of these severe crashes at intersections were happening um, at intersections that do have transit stops, and then half of the mid-block crashes were happening near where transit stops are. I want to be really clear about one thing. This is not saying that transit is causing these crashes. That is not what this analysis is saying. It's simply looking at the proximity. Um, so it's not saying that transit riders are the one involved. It's certainly not transit vehicles. Um, we were able to do that breakout. Um, but this is something that may inform other work too, as far as these may be potential locations to look at for future improvements. Next slide, please. So this was another data set that we used that was kind of a stand-in for other data that we are actually breaking out specifically in the systemic analysis, where we looked at functional classification and where crashes were happening. Um, and you know, in some ways, unsurprisingly, um, even though minor arterials are only 14% of our total network, 64% of the severe pedestrian crashes are happening on these roads. And the functional classification was kind of a proxy for like vehicle volumes, vehicle speeds, um, and number of lanes, which can be some of those risk factors involved in pedestrian crashes. I will mention in this initial analysis, we did not have it broken out by A minor arterials and other arterials. Um, that is something our technical group requested and we'll be working to include that in the final synopsis of this analysis. Next slide, please. So with crash data state at the state level and across the country, we do not get race and ethnicity data from what's reported on state crash data report form. So typically the way we do that analysis is to use American Community Survey or census data to look at the demographics for where these crashes are happening. Um, so we did that um, for all of the pedestrian crashes and that finding and this chart on the slide is from that level of analysis um, where we found that census tracts with higher shares of black or Native American residents um, tended to have more of these pedestrian crashes and then conversely tracks with higher percentages of white residents tended to have fewer of them. I will notice, so for fatalities only, there is kind of a higher level of data collection at the federal level where they are able to pull from additional data sources for a federal national database. Um, so they're able to get additional information from things such as death certificates. So we did actually analyze that data so that was specific to the individuals involved again, just for fatalities, um, and that disproportionality bore out, unfortunately, in that analysis as well, where for this four-year period, um, we found that 16.5% of those who died as pedestrians were Black or African American. That's compared to just under 10% of our population in the region. The numbers for Native Americans always tend to be significantly smaller, um, but it's an important group to call out because their numbers are just small overall, they tend to get lost a lot of times. And when we looked at that, we did see that similar disproportionality. Again, even though the numbers are smaller, there's still that disproportionality there with 3.7% of the pedestrian deaths were Native Americans um, versus just under half a percent of the population. Um, so again, you know, it's it's similar to the transit data, right? Where we're not able to directly link this to a cause. Um, it may be related to exposure if people are are walking more we did do some additional analysis just tied um, for Minneapolis and St. Paul, where we had the data available for what you may be familiar with as redlined areas in the past, 
or areas that were kind of rated differently based on racial makeup um, and there were racially um, discriminatory lending practices for housing in the past and those um, sometimes are suggestive of, of patterns of disinvestment in areas over time um, and we did find a correlation again with where these crashes were happening and, and the redlined areas just in those two communities. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, really kind of the core of this project is doing the systemic analysis. So not just looking where crashes have happened, but really going further to look at what those risk factors are for where those crashes have happened, because there's there's always a certain degree of randomness with fatalities and um, it's, it's a little bit of a losing battle to just chase individual locations where they've happened. Um, and so I wanted to really take a look at the network as a whole and see where these risk factors are present and provide that data to our local communities in um, different maps that we'll have available that we're still working on. Um, this could help local communities understand this issue for pedestrian safety in their area. It could potentially be used um, for solicitation funding um, and just supporting other safety work and other um, recommendations and initiatives such as selecting countermeasures or other planning work such as corridor studies. Um, I will mention, so initially we were planning on the recommendation from the regional solicitation to be more directly tied to this analysis and these risk assessment maps. Um, we still have a little bit more work to do after our technical group meeting on that to really make these more intuitive. So the recommendation that's going forward to our technical advisory group next week is informed by this initial analysis, but it's not going to be directly tied to these maps at this time for this, this next round. Next slide, please. And this just reiterates the next steps that I mentioned earlier. As I mentioned, we're taking the solicitation recommendation to our technical advisory group next week, and then we'll be planning to bring that to funding and programming committee at their July meeting and then through the following committees. And we'll still be going back to kind of review the feedback we've got on this draft systemic analysis to make that a little bit more usable. And then, as I mentioned, the countermeasure and other recommendations will follow this fall. Next slide. And with that, I would be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. Um, and be happy to come back in the future for a future update as we have the information. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, does anybody have questions for Heidi or Mr. comments, uh, inquiries relative to the work done to date? Uh, Member Boyles? Mr. Chair. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, was there any data on causation, pedestrian versus vehicle operator? The reason I ask is if we, uh, if Dr. Fisher is correct, uh, the human element in vehicle operation is going to become less and less and the theory theoretically reduces the likelihood of these severe accidents. I'm sure that's probably a, a pipe um, Mr. Chair and, and members, um, so I think the, the question about autonomous vehicles, if that can address, I mean, we do have data in the, in the, in the crash data, there's usually like fault attributed. I would just say it's, it's a little bit of an artificial binary because it's driver and pedestrian and the infrastructure, the system, um, is not really, um, expressly considered in that. And that's part of what we're trying, what we're trying to focus on in this work. Um, I would say with autonomous vehicles, there would need to be some intentional policy work around that too, to ensure that pedestrians really are addressed um, in that. There can be, um, I've heard initial equity considerations too, as far as the ability of the technology to recognize people of color um, more adequately. So I think that's it's an area that's going to grow quite a bit, um, but that's again, kind of where the safe systems approach is recognizing that like, we're not there. We don't have technology that to solve all of these things yet. And we're human and we make mistakes. So how can we design systems so that there's some there's some redundancy there, whether it's going at lower speeds so that if somebody is hit, they're less likely to be serious, seriously injured. Um, that's kind of part of the logic behind the safe systems approach. Mr. Chair, I have a question. However, I'd like to defer to uh, board member Sanger, who I think has a uh, a weak connection because I heard her chime in to ask a question. Yeah, I just uh, looked at, thank you, Member Keeley. I just looked in the chat and she does have a question. Uh, so we'll go to Member Sanger first and then on to Member Keeley. Thank you. Uh, my question 
has to do with something that you did not mention in your um, presentation, which is sidewalks. And I am wondering whether you will be doing analysis to test the, I guess, the widespread belief that having sidewalks cuts down on pedestrian injuries and fatalities. And if you're doing that, will you be looking at the question of whether, to what extent Met Council can have additional policies or programs aimed at sidewalk uh, construction? Great question, um, Mr. Chair and Member Sanger. Um, great question. Um, so I'll start by saying that some, the retrospective crash data analysis was kind of looking at crash types. And so some of that is kind of looking at um, whether they're walking along a roadway. So if you, for example, did not have a sidewalk, you would be walking along a roadway in presence more likely. You may be on the side of the road. Right. Um, and so what's um, those initial findings, and I, I believe we have a slide. We had a slide for our technical advisory group that was like way more um, than you would probably ever want to see as far as crash data analysis. So we can kind of bury you in crash data analysis. Um, but I can pull that out and share that with a group of thoughts of interest. That was a much lower percentage. The major, the vast majority of what's happening where people are being killed, the most dangerous thing as a pedestrian in our region is trying to cross the street, right? Um, so walking it long is a much smaller percentage of that. The highest risk and what we're seeing in the numbers are people trying to cross at intersections. Okay. Um, I will say also too, we have it on our work plan. Um, we actually do not have data. The way we have data for roads, we don't have that data region wide for sidewalks and pedestrian facilities. Um, we do have that in our work plan. Um, it's something that kind of from a pilot from our GIS staff a couple of years ago learned it's not as easy as just collecting it from all of our local partners because that's in such widely differing formats and applications um, if they even have it um, that it will be something that we'll need to look at just creating with partners um, so I, I hope that answered your question but thank you member Keeley thank you mr chair uh Ms. Schilberg um I wanted to just it's a process question because uh, although I represent the suburban transit providers I can't get away from my city council hat so I think about all the meetings I'm in uh, related to pedestrian safety, driver safety, intersections, et cetera. And we just had one uh, at our council meeting last night. And so how do, does the Met Council uh, or how will you work through with the counties and the cities in the metropolitan region and work together? Because it, it seems like we have cities, counties and the state or the Metropolitan Council all doing this type of study and work. And I wonder how do we bring that together to get some process efficiency and efficiency and also sharing of the data. What, as you noted, sometimes you can't get, it comes in different flavors and different types, but uh, how, how can that be uh, worked together? And, and do you see yourself presenting uh, at some point in the future to a city or a county uh, meeting uh, for those interested in hearing uh, the work that you're doing? Great question. Um, Mr. Chair and members, um, so as I mentioned, we are working with technical advisory group on this project. Our local partners are really key to this, right? Met Council does not own these roadways, so we don't have the ability to go out and make infrastructure improvements to this. So all of the counties have representative on our technical advisory group and are really critical partners to this. Um, right now we have a fewer number of cities on the technical advisory group, but that's also in part to why we're coming back through our committees um, with this information. Um, so I would say, for, you know, some of what we're doing, it's at a regional level. So, like, we have had some kind of follow up conversations with some of our technical advisory group members of how, how can this be useful to somebody at a city level um, that may vary kind of based on the size of the city, too. Um, so we're trying to learn, like, what data might be helpful to communities to make this more usable. Um, and yes, certainly, as we go through the project and have more to share. Um, be interested if there are other groups that would be interested in hearing about this that would be willing to come and present and get feedback from. Thank you. All right, thanks, Member Keeley. Uh, folks, I'm looking at the clock. We got about a half hour to go. We got some ground to cover here. Does anybody else have questions for Heidi Schalbert? Otherwise, I think we'll let her go for now and then we'll uh, move right into the uh, next presentation. Um, and that is the um, 
before and after study styled the before and after study phase two, which has been uh, the effort of the council along with some outside consultants to, I guess, refine the approach for monitoring after conditions of projects that have received federal transportation funds through the tab in the council. So here's the project team. We've got uh, David Burns from MTS with us and I think Lance Bernard is here as well. And I'll turn it over to David Burns. Hi, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, uh, committee. Glad to be here. Uh, David Burns, I'm a transportation planner with MTS and project manager for this project. So I'm just going to briefly introduce this and then hand it over to Lance, who will tell you about some of the outcomes and findings of phase two of this study. Um, so as I just mentioned, today we'll be providing an overview of the major fun, uh, uh, findings of the regional solicitation before and after study part two. Uh, the study kicked off in spring of 2020. Um, and we have completed a final draft of the document, which was uh, attached to the agenda. Um, so overall, the idea is that this study will assist the council and the TAB and its stakeholders in determining if the criteria used in the solicitation are successful in garnering the desired outcomes and also help inform potential changes to future solicitations. So phase one of this project was completed in 2019, and it included a recommendation to develop a project database, which Lance will talk about. And that's just to better monitor and track funded projects, um, and as well as a comprehensive peer review as part of uh, phase one of the study. Um, so overall, the work from phase one of the study kind of prompted a number of additional questions, and that's why we, uh, uh, completed phase two of the study. And with that, I am going to go ahead and hand it off to Lance to cover some of the findings. Thank you, David, uh, chair and the members of the committee. Appreciate the opportunity to be in front of you again. Um, had the opportunity to work on the first phase of the study and uh, also leading the, the second phase here with uh, Bolton and Mink as well. So um, my name is Lance Bernard. I'm a, a planner with HKGI and been working very closely with David on this effort. So. I'll uh, help get you guys back on schedule here and, and keep uh, this brief. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so phase two of the study really looked to build off of a lot of the efforts that went underway with the phase one study of really trying to get a better understanding of what are the benefits of the built projects um, throughout the region that have received regional uh, solicitation funds. And in order to do that, we've, we've done a number of different measures and, and metrics that we'll talk a little bit about. Uh, but in addition to that, we also wanted to find some opportunities to help streamline the application process and really find opportunities to improve or refine or tweak the, tweak the application process. And a large part of that effort was really working with a number of focus groups. Uh, we recognize that a lot of these grant applications are being prepared um, by outs but communities are hiring consultants to do it. So we've worked with a lot of our partners and a lot of our colleagues among seven different firms to just interview them, get a better idea of what they're hearing from their client communities and, and how we can improve the application process. In addition to that, we wanted to look a little bit closer at a couple of different elements, um, looking at how we can uh, improve the bike fed measure, uh, look at the risk assessment criteria, and also dove in a little bit on, well, we, we did uh, work on the, um, developing a, uh, best practices for using cross modification factors for uh, the HSIP applications and other elements of the regional solicitation grants. Next slide, please. So for some context, uh, this effort has been looking at uh, the last four funding cycles, 2014, 16, 18, and 2020. Over those four funding cycles, uh, the region, the Met Council has received over 1.8 a billion dollars in funding requests, which I think is just a testament of how much um, funding needs there are for the transportation system throughout the region, and, and certainly a demonstration of how competitive and, and popular this program is with communities. Um, from those requests, the Met Council has been able to award about 40% of those uh, requests of $782 million. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, as I mentioned, one of the larger efforts of part of this phase one and phase two study was really looking at ways to measure uh, the benefits, making sure that these dollars are going to projects that are um, seeing regional benefits from a congestion standpoint, safety, 
contributing to the RBTN network, transit ridership, and, and providing good access to certain areas uh, in the community. So um, we looked uh, at building a, a database that uh, we've given to Met Council staff to help monitor these uh, metrics uh, over time. And one of the um, data limitations for us in this effort was really being able to get good data uh, during such a, a weird time um, with the pandemic. So specifically, you know, transit ridership. This was something that we, we were able to really measure because we know those ridership numbers are, are off based on some of the anomalies with travel patterns throughout the region. Uh, next slide. So uh, won't bore you with the in and out of that database and, and a lot of those kind of technical methodologies that we've developed and, and a lot of that has also been um, presented to the TAC funding and programming and other groups uh, internally to get their feedback on that. But wanted to provide a little bit of a snapshot of the congestion measure. Um, we were recommending that Met Council staff continue to use Streetlight data, um, a, a new platform of thousands of cell phone records that give you the ability to look at traffic movement throughout uh, the region. And so um, what we're really trying to look at are projects that have been built and have been open after construction for over three years. So a lot of those projects that we're confident in measuring those benefits are projects that have received funding uh, through the 2014 cycle. So as you can see here, here's a snapshot of a few of those projects that are demonstrating uh, some congestion congestion benefits of uh, travel time reduction. Uh, the, the ones here in front of you are car projects in Carver County, Dakota County, and Rural County. Uh, next slide, please. One of the other measures is looking at safety. Um, one of our efforts uh, was to, uh, again, provide Met Council staff a tool that they can easily monitor safety benefits um, over a long period of time and be able to look at uh, projects um, that have received funding. And so this tool that we've created is kind of a GIS platform with Bolton and Mink's help in, in being able to monitor those safety benefits and where there has been reductions in crashes um, and cost benefits uh, related to projects. So next slide, please. So uh, kind of the snapshot of that crash uh, metric um, in, in that tool, we can see that there's a number of projects that have received funding uh, that are seeing uh, benefits from a safety perspective, um, looking at uh, a couple here just to give you uh, an idea of, of some of those projects. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, you know, we recognize that there's a lot of demand for, for transportation funding. A lot of communities have a lot of needs, and, and so this is a very competitive program. Um, it does uh, garner a lot of applications and, and you know, certainly can't fund all of those. So really looking at how those unfunded projects are being built, are they being resubmitted? So we did see certainly a large number of applications that are going through multiple solicitation cycles and hoping to secure some of those funding. Um, in addition to that, uh, projects that are being built without regional solicitation funds, we've heard through a lot of the communities that they are still finding ways to build those projects, but they may be scaling them back a little bit in respect to some of fewer amenities or enhancements uh, with the lack of uh, uh, other outside funding sources that they're not able to secure. So just some nuggets of info on that one there. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the non-motorized uh, summary of is kind of where we're looking at some of the regional benefits to the bicycle pedestrian system was where uh, projects are contributing to the RBTN network. So over the last four funding cycles, projects that have received funding have helped contribute to uh, about 75 miles of the RBTN network and reaching some of those levels that uh, council has set. Uh, we're also lo looked at ways to improve the application pedestrian bicycle measure, uh, looking at a number of different MPOs and how they score uh, ped bike usage. And we felt that uh, leaning on some of those MPO peer reviews or maybe opportunities to look at how to score projects based on their comfort level. Are there uh, certain designs or um, facility types that really help improve safety or improve one's comfort level when, when traveling by foot or bike? So opportunities there to look at that criteria in future solicitations. Next slide, please. Um, going into this study, uh, certainly as part of the phase one and, and phase two effort, we heard a fair amount of 
um, comments about looking at the risk assessment criteria and is there opportunities to refine that or to um, um, change it up in some way. And so our, we started this kind of assessment really looking at the number of projects that have um, been withdrawn that have received funding or have requested program year extensions. And really through that kind of finding and through our focus groups, we felt that there wasn't really anything glaring that would um, make us recommend removing the risk assessment criteria in any way, but continuing to recognize that the risk assessment criteria is very important to have in place to make sure people are doing their due diligence and making sure they're going through the public engagement process, making sure uh, projects are shovel ready, going through the design phases, environmental phases to really uh, make sure that uh, they can eliminate any of those potential risks. Uh, so when they do receive funding, they can get that project built on time and within budget. Uh, so next slide. Uh, so to wrap up kind of key takeaways that I think are, are important to note from a lot of our uh, focus group discussions is just how uh, people understand the regional solicitation program. And I think a number of us who work on these grant applications or part of committees scoring applications are very familiar with the program, but a number of communities don't necessarily understand the program as well as we do. And so finding opportunities to really create more transparency or uh, build in some more education to really let people know how projects are being scored and selected. And certainly some of their, the confusion that might be out there is because there are so many different funding categories and is funding being stretched across too many categories, which creates a little bit of uncertainty of really what the objectives are and goals are behind regional solicitation. So um, there are areas there to think about and, and improve upon in the future. but. Certainly uh, lots to celebrate, lots to be excited about and how successful this program has been uh, over the years and through the before and after conditions assessments. It's certainly a lot of great benefits to, to recognize. Um, so keeping it brief, I'll, I'll wrap it up there. Um, you know, the report uh, has a lot, a wealth of information you can glean from. We really hope that that uh, report is used more as a resource to help guide future discussions amongst the committees um, and to use it as in that fashion. So thank you for the opportunity. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Bernard or for Dave? All right, gentlemen, thanks for that presentation. Thank appreciate you. that update. Uh, and I know your work is ongoing in nature and, and important to do. And, and one of the things that uh, is a continual uh, curiosity, I guess, would be one way to say it for the members of the tab is when we uh, award all of this money now close to uh, three quarters of a billion dollars over the, I think you said the past four solicitations, what kind of bang are we getting for the buck? Are we getting uh, the expected return that uh, that we thought we would see on these projects? and uh, some of the counties uh, and cities may have other ways to report out on it, uh, their own successes with the uh, funding that they've they've used federally to match up with their own funding. Uh, that might be interesting way to report out on some things too. So thanks for joining us today. And then we're gonna jump into these final three items, five, six, and seven. They're all related. Amy Venowitz is gonna provide a little bit of an introduction. Sure. Then uh, we're gonna jump into it. Um, and uh, here we go. Amy, go ahead. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm going to provide just a short introduction to the regional solicitation items that are on your agenda today. And then I'll turn it over to Joe Barbeau, who will go over the details of each item. So I think it helps for TAB to think about the regional solicitation as a series of topics and decisions that you're going to be making over the next few months. And then as you make these decisions, we kind of compile it all, we put it into the application in various formats. And then the final decision you are asked to make is to adopt the application in total for release. And so what we're doing over the next couple months is trying to set up a series of topics for you. We will first bring an information item on each topic that gives you the opportunity to ask questions about how we've done it in the past, provide feedback, 
from your perspective. And then also to ask us to consider any options for changes that you might think uh, are needed. And then we will bring those options back to the technical committees for discussion and review. So after we've gone through the information items, the items are then moved forward as an action item that will first go to funding and programming and TAC, and then come back to TAB uh, two months from now. So the four topics that you are seeing today are for information, but then in August, you will be asked to make uh, take an action on these items. So we're kind of following this course to give you this opportunity today to ask questions and also to make sure that any concerns or issues are raised now and not when we are actually adopting the actual item because that'll be too late for us to then put potential changes in front of you. Uh, honestly, at this point in time, we are really expecting that most of the action items that you will see will recommend leaving the particular action the same way that it was in the 2020 solicitation. We do have a few minor changes that are currently being thought about by the technical committees, but overall I would label those as minor changes to the solicitation. And one reason for this is that the solicitation we typically follow about a 10 year schedule. So every 10 years, we go through a major reevaluation of the solicitation, but this occurs after we have adopted a new regional plan and a new transportation policy plan. Currently, currently we're on schedule to update both Thrive and the TPP in 2024, at which time they will become 2050 plans rather than 2040. Those two plans will set new policy direction, new values for the region. And then the following year in 2025, we will go through a major reevaluation of the solicitation to make sure it aligns with the regional plans. Now, all of that is not to say that you can't make changes now. You certainly can, um, but we are on a short time frame. And so that's why we're kind of going through these discussions to get any issues out on the table as early as possible and to think about those changes before the action items come before you. So that is the process we're following. We, as I said, we have four topics today. You will see the action items for those in August. In July, we will bring another series of topics, I believe four more topics to you. And then the action items for those topics will be before you in September. And, um, and also in September, after September, we will be releasing the draft application for public review. So that's the schedule we're following right now. And if there are no questions, I'll turn it over to Joe to go over the specific topics for today. Thank you, Amy, for that big picture perspective. And I think um, <clears throat> to the extent that you you uh, need comments from folks, I think you'd like to have them uh, at least two weeks in advance of the July meeting. Is that correct? Uh, yes, particularly I'll come back at the end when we have the criteria slide up because that one is of particular concern. But um, we'll we'll cover that at the end today. All right. Very good. All right. Let's jump over to Joe. I think he's going to make the presentation. Yep, thanks, Mr. Chair, Amy, members. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. So um, this is sort of uh, what Amy talked about. So let's go to the next one. So uh, the first of those three info items that we've kind of rolled into one PowerPoint uh, is on modal funding ranges. And those of you who have been around will probably remember the history um, of that, uh, of those funding ranges you see um, in 2003 through 2018. We have stuck with that pretty pretty closely um, since I arrived in 2014 and, and sort of stuck with the, the history. Now in 2020, after we uh, added the ABRT $25 million category, we upped the midpoint of transit from 27% to 30%, um, which lowered the midpoints of the other modes of bid. So what happened last year, however, was that uh, we were about at the midpoint of those modes uh, prior to 
uh, assigning over programming funds, which went entirely in roadways and bike ped. So we actually ended up funding, I want to say 25, 26% in transit, but that's within the range. So that's, that's okay. So uh, our history of, of hitting the midpoint uh, or hitting very, very close to the midpoint uh, was kind of over with, but we uh, was kind of paused, I guess, but we uh, did uh, get within the range and uh, we would anticipate that the midpoint shown for 2020 would hold through to 2022, um, barring any, any um, clamoring for change. But also last year, I'm sorry, last cycle was when we added the unique projects category where we actually took 2.5% uh, of the funding off of the top uh, to program this time around for a short turnaround for programming unique projects. So um, we'll be doing that. So this uh, these, this 100% you see there is is after the removal of that 2.5% for, um, for unique projects. So it would be anticipated that there'd be 2.5% for unique projects uh, for the upcoming solicitation to be programmed two years after that in 2024. Um, next slide. <clears throat> so, um, Joe, you might want to make that distinction between uh, unique projects being funded for, was it 2022? As opposed to being four years out on the calendar on the rest of them? Yeah, yes, Mr. Chair. So um, in the 2020 solicitation that we just completed, uh, we are uh, we we funded for fiscal uh, for funding years 24 and 25, and we're doing that also with unique projects, but we're not programming them until this coming cycle. And the reason, so basically, we take that unique projects money and program it uh, two years behind. So um, the reason for that is uh, that unique projects tend to be innovative and um, it's it's and not 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 encompassing certain uh, um, certain difficulties that a lot of big roadway projects uh, pro, uh, encompass. So um, it makes more sense to have a quicker turnaround on those. Um, and in the meantime, we're uh, Cole Hineker is is helping lead a group to uh, determine what some of the uh, review factors will be for selecting unique projects. So what we're looking at decision wise is like I mentioned, there's not a lot of um, expectation, uh, expectation of change, but you can see um, that uh, you will be adopting um, that or something like that uh, two months from now, and that the potential actions would be, to, uh, if you look at the second bullet, keep modal funding ranges the, the same, i.e. no change, or to return to that historical average from 2003 to 2018, or maybe develop something new, or do something to the unique projects but that will be discussed uh, in the interim between now and August. So the next, I, before I move on to the next topic, does anybody have any questions about funding ranges? Mr. Chair, I just have a housekeeping. In the uh, future agenda items that was shared to uh, with us, there are two entries, one in July and August, I believe it is, that are um, a mirror image of one another, and it's a discussion of the funding breakout, I think, and I don't have it in front of me at the second, but was that a deliberate uh, entry for both of the meetings to cover that subject, given it more than one meeting to hash out, or was that a, uh, meant to be something else? Uh, Mr. Chair, members, I'm hoping Elaine can answer that one. I will bring that up just a second. Next slide in the interim. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I think Elaine, he might be referring to the geographic distribution versus the modal funding ranges yeah you see those duplicated I, I, the verbiage is ident identical for both months oh. tab meetings and i was just curious because and i apologize the presenter is touching on that subject right now i thought it's appropriate to bring it up to clarify if that's the intent of the uh, those two meetings what i'm seeing for july we have the regional station discussion on criteria weighting, the measures, and geographic balance definition. We do have for action items in August, the application categories, the modal funding ranges. So the items that are information today will be going before tab for action in August. And the the uh, the note or in the projected July is that was that basically the discussion point then and then decision point in 
August. So it is the same subject, but two phases of the process. That's correct. Okay, thank you. I misread. The that. idea is to get feedback from the tab members now to bring back to the technical committees if there's anything you want them to look at to put into the action item. Yeah. And then when we get to the end of this discussion uh, on these three items collectively, then we'll, uh, Amy will take us back to this criteria weighting uh, because that's something we need information on in advance of the July meeting so we can have a conversation about that uh, and it won't uh, then we we won't be doing that in August when we would just be coming to vote all that information will be well in hand when people come to vote in August and we won't be trying to put new information in front of folks at the last minute thank you all right go ahead Joe okay so on to that next topic um the application categories uh, at the in 2014 we had an overhaul um, where we shifted more from modal uh, from um, funding categories to modal categories, and those have held fairly firm since 2014. The biggest difference is being that spot mobility and safety was added as a new category, that third bullet under roadways, and then arterial bus rail bus rapid transit, that first bullet under transit slash TDM. Uh, the ABRT was, of course, um, uh, a way to get a larger uh, regional project funded in one stage instead of two, three, or four stages. And then the spot mobility and safety, uh, the purpose was to fund lower cost intersection type projects that um, either enhance safety and or mobility and to try to uh, get more, more smaller scale projects that way. Uh, these other categories are what you have seen in the past. So next slide. So um, again, on what we would be talking about with categories is, um, is that uh, in th uh, most likely there wouldn't be a change of those categories. Um, one thing that will change uh, is that in the final text of the solicitation, each category will have its own uh, purpose statement. And that comes from discussion, uh, some of the feedback we had in the before and after study and other places that say some of the applicants aren't necessarily certain of the purpose of each of the funding categories. So that's being created as we speak. Uh, we, we had drafts of that uh, at the staff level and um, funding and programming committee. We'll see that tomorrow in TAC, TAC and TAB next month to try to um, share uh, share with applicants what those, uh, what really are the purpose of some of these, um, these uh, categories. And so like the primary purpose might be for spot mobility and safety, for example, 25% are for safety measures. So that's a big part of the purpose of that category. Um, and then in August, uh, you, you would, uh, approve the application categories and the purpose statements um, and the expectation would be for minimal to no change uh, from 2020. Um, so next slide. So, was there a question? No, Joe, I was just going to just get, uh, get a clarification from you. So on the um, on the information item on the table one, uh, what I count are 12 categories uh, that were in the last solicitation for 2020. And the question is, should we be adding any new categories? And what we're saying is that that's not recommended. Uh, let's deal with that in 2025. But people should be thinking about that between now and July. And then just to sort of segue off of what you talked about relative to purpose, uh, we'll be adding a purpose statement for each one of these 12 categories uh, so that you'll see that in July. Is that a correct. fair summary? Okay. Mr. Chair, that's correct. All right. Thank you. Go ahead. M Mr. Chair, um, this is Amy. I just also want to clarify while we're saying 12 application categories, we're also anticipating continuing the unique projects which right. comes off the top. So that's actually 13 categories. Yeah, good, uh, it's a good catch, yep. So uh, Mr. Chair and members, the, uh, the 12 that we had been talking about are on this table, uh, unique projects is not. Um, and these 12 have minimum and maximum awards assigned. Um, and you can see these here, uh, some of the, uh, most of the points I'm gonna make it in the next slide, but um, the minimum federal award on the left column exists to sort of protect applicants from uh, undertaking a, a small project that ends up not being worth the effort because when you do receive federal funding, you do have a lot of requirements that go along with it, uh, some costs and a lot of administration. And then the maximum awards uh, exist in order to help spread funding around and, uh, 
Uh, they provide what we believe is a, uh, an adequate amount of funding for most projects that might be applied for. But um, um, in theory, without a maximum, you could have one project take up the lion's share of, of a modal allotment. So these uh, maximum awards exist to um, help spread funds geographically and help fund more projects. So next slide. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have a question. Yes, Member uh, Dariana. Joe, are these uh, ranges set by us, uh, by, by, by TAB as well? Um, Mr. Chair and members, yes, they were set, well, probably before 2014, but they were set in 2014 and small changes have occurred over the years since. Um, Greg, if you could go back one. Thank you. Um, so, for example, that $10 million you see in strategic capacity was at, bumped from $7 million last time. Um, and my recollection, and Amy or Elaine or somebody can, can correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, technical members who are participating in the process sort of cited the increasing cost of some of those projects, those are bigger projects, uh, maybe as a way to fund fewer of those projects, um, but uh, to make a bigger bang. But yeah, those are set by TAB and approved by TAB. Yeah, and, and, and I think uh, I remember Nariana. I was thinking that another example, and I think you might have been here, was that in the transit and TDM projects category, the arterial bus rapid transit project, where we made a determination to put that at twenty-five million. So that okay. was a change. That was a change from the past. That was we, we doing that funding in a different way. So will we have an opportunity to weigh in on on this again this time around in either the July or the August meetings? Yes, but I think uh, the best place, the best timing on that would be July. Okay, Thank that's you. why we wanted to. We wanted to get all this information to all the tab members in June, so we could have a more in-depth conversation on all the elements of this. Uh, as Amy said, all of the uh, I think about this as a series of topics, all these different topics uh, in July, and then when we come back uh, in August, and we can just vote on things. Mr. Chair, um, and we can change this, but I might correct your last statement a little bit in that the topics we have today are starting as action items with funding and programming in um, July. So, um, and then they will come back to you as action items in August. Right. So, particularly if there are additional options that you think we should be putting in front of the technical committee. And I do know that they have already discussed whether to lower that 10 million for strategic capacity back or not. And at this point, I think uh, the technical committee advice probably is leaning towards leaving it the same as it was in 2020. So they, they have been talking already about potential changes to these items, but at this point, it's not looking like they would recommend anything. Uh, and I think that's one reason we're here today is to try to make sure that that's lining up with what TAB is thinking too. And if that is one that you want to specifically revisit in July, we could do that, but otherwise, in July, we were bringing different topics um, for your consideration. Mr. Chair, uh, on that note, I, I, I did pull up the uh, future agenda items and, and it looks like uh, informational discussion, August 18th meeting, project selection guarantees, and it notes the 7 million max for BRT uh, and, and this is a BRT with the 25 million, but that's when I thought that that discussion that I believe uh, Mr. Naranian had was was referring to is to have that discussion that was had a year ago that made the change for the 25 million carve out for ABRT and have tab take that back up and have that discussion. So what I hear Miss um, Venowitz stating is maybe we should have that today uh, before it goes to TAC, or can we still have it in July? And, uh, and not be sort of after the fact. So, Mr. Chair, I might add a little bit of information there. So there are really two decisions related to arterial BRT. One is, should we have an arterial BRT category with a maximum of 25 million? And then a second decision is related to what we call um, uh, 
I think project guarantees, where between transit expansion and transit modernization categories, we allow only one additional BRT to be funded within those categories. So it's, there's really two separate questions within that. It's actually a max of seven million, so it could be two smaller projects. Right. And I well, what, see I, what, I under, what I understood we were going to do was that uh, folks would have some time to absorb this information at this meeting. That we would be, they would be coming back on for conversation at the July meeting. But in the July meeting, you would also be presenting information. Uh, on, on other elements of the regional solicitation that we would then take up for voting in September, but again discuss in August. So I'm I'm a little out of sequence with you and what I was thinking. Well, and um, I would think we certainly can do that, particularly because we're really squished for time today. So I, well, I don't think you're going to even if we weren't uh, having a time compression problem. I don't think it's fair to ask uh, folks to make a decision today uh, on these items. I think they should be held off till July so people have a chance to absorb the information and think about what they want to do because the uh, presentations were, I think, an important element of uh, uh, of the information that people would be receiving. So anyway. Sure. Then, Ms. I agree, Mr. Chair. And so I think what we'll do is ask that either today or behind the scenes, if you have different options that you think should be considered um, for each of these items, either put it on the table today and we'll bring that back for discussion in July, or you can contact staff after the meeting and make us aware that you want an option to be discussed in July. And we'll bring that back. Um, as I said, right now, most of the technical recommendations are trending towards leaving it the same. So having discussions about whether that's what TAB agrees should be happening can occur in July. Mr. Chair? Yes. Remember, is that Member Geisler? That's Council Member Reich. Oh, Council Member Reich. Thank you, Member Reich. Go ahead. Yeah, I think it would be helpful to have, uh, if the technical committee is recommending no change, uh, if we could have a sense of why that is, particularly since we've now uh, made the change and we've had applications, uh, what about that experience informs the um, status quo uh, position uh, or might suggest uh, further conversation from the TAB's end? So at minimum, that would be good information to have back from tax perspective to inform our conversation subsequent to that. Yeah, that's a good thought. Chair, after that question was asked, I did see uh, TAC Chair Solberg's camera come on. So I don't know if he had a response to that. Perhaps not. Perhaps I misread what I saw. <laughs> yeah, no, Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes. I, part of the reason is uh, that TAC isn't recommending a change to these at this point is as you've all been discussing, uh, specifically on the uh, ABRT, that was just uh, put in this last solicitation. So we have um, the changes that were made for the last solicitation just been selected. It's only been one round. So there's really no data for us at this point to make any other suggested changes. And that's really the basis of yeah, why right. we yeah. suggested oh, leaving. Right. So, I, I, Chair Solberg, let me ask you another question. Um, my understanding was that some of these, or all these decisions, were policy decisions to be made by the TAB, which was the thinking of the TAC. Uh, so, but now we're hearing that some recommendations may be made by the TAC. So, could you make that distinction for us on? where you're going to feel comfortable making a recommendation uh, from the TAC to the TAB and where you want policy direction guidance from the TAB before it's you have so, a conversation? Yes, Mr. Chair. So I think uh, the biggest thing that TAC um, is it do or 
um, that TAB can do for TAC to serve them better is providing the the, um, the the priorities to which then TAC can make those uh, analysis and give feedback on to TAB. So in this case, clearly arterial BRT is a priority at 25 million at a uh, um, as a max federal award. But if, for instance, TAB was very interested in, as we heard today, pedestrian and um, the, the safety issues around it and wanted to try and address those in the region, then a clear step towards that would be to say we should raise the amount or um, the percentage of the regional solicitation that's going towards that. So those are, that's why those become more policy issues we can recommend percentages based on, on what we're seeing for data, but right now there's no data from this most recent solicitation again as those projects won't be built for four more years. Yeah, yeah good point. But Mr. Chair, could I uh, ask for some more clarification on sure, exactly Reverend what the, Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, I'm still a little confused about what the exact order of operations is here. Um, so are we coming back in July to have another discussion, a policy discussion on our priorities as in terms of what we'd like to set as modal funding ranges, for example, and what we'd like to have as these uh, modal application categories and also maybe discuss, you know, what the minimum and maximum award should be. Would we be talking about that in July and then making a decision on that in August? That was my understanding of what we were going to do. And then uh, there was some um contrary uh thought i think i don't know contrary is a good choice of words but uh my thinking is that we would be having this discussion today on all of these different um topics that affect the regional solicitation people would have an opportunity to go back for a month and think about what they wanted to do and consult with uh to the extent you might be an elected official like a county commissioner consult with your technical people or a city and then we would have this discussion again in more depth because in that gap period then people could uh, between now and the meeting in july uh people could submit information about uh their view on on some of these things in terms of uh, you could raise the uh uh the idea of minimum and maximum awards for example or the funding categories themselves uh and then staff would be prepared to discuss that in july and then we could have that broad informational discussion in july that would, I think, settle people on the direction they wanted to head, but we wouldn't vote on that until August. At least that's what I'm thinking would be at least one way to, to do it that uh, gave people uh, some comfort that we had enough time to do the work the right way. Mr. Chair, Stan Karwaski here. I, I think you describe it while I fully support that piece of action. Mr. Chair? Um, we can definitely do that and make it work. I think um, we'll have an internal conversation about what goes back to the technical committees. Typically, it goes back to funding and programming and then TAC and then TAB, which would put the decision in September, uh, which is also a possibility too. So we'll just, we'll work on the schedule a little bit more, but at this point, we'll plan on all of these subjects having discussion in July. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Amy. And thank you, Mr. Chair. And just one final comment here. I have to go in a minute, but it, uh, it these seem to me very much like policy decisions as opposed to uh, technical decisions. And so I uh, really urge that we have a chance to kind of really get into the meat of this. So thank you very much. Yeah, yeah thank you, uh, Member Mariana. Uh, Mr. Chair. All right. Yes. That's Matt uh, Holland. Matt, never Holland said, go ahead. I thought that was you. <laughs> I just want to make sure that I remember correctly. When we made the change about ABRT, it was because we were funding three or four ABRTs at about six or so million dollars per year. And we just thought it was much more efficient to fund one at 25 million and get it done and then start the next. Is that correct? Can staff just verify that or not? 
Mr. Chair, I would agree with that. Um, we yeah. had the $7 million maximum and it, it was clunky to be funding like three at $7 million and then they would come back for other pieces of it and it was simpler and reflective of some of the larger scale um, regional things that other like regional transit projects that other MPOs have done in their solicitations. Mm -hmm. um, so, but anyway, in any case, I think Matt, uh, Matt's um, assessment of that is correct. But I thought my recollection is that that was one of the decisions that came out of that working group uh, as a recommendation yes. to the tab. And then uh, the tab, uh, after listening to the information, decided to adopt that. I hope my memory is close to accurate on that. Yeah, Mr. Chair, if I, yes, that is what happened. And yes, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, there was a peer review study done of, of other MPOs, like for example, Denver, which tends to spend uh, bigger lump sums on a project. And as I recall, we decided that you know if we do multiple funding over if we do funding over multiple solicitations. We never get. We wouldn't get a, uh, an ABRT line complete, so we decided to go with the 25 million and get it done and get it into service to, to the community, as Matt said. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I think what was that? You 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 uh, described it precisely. I think it was taking us four solicitations to fund an ABRT project, and we decided to, uh, after studying everything, that we would recommend that 25 million. Uh, out of each solicitation to fund an ABRT project. Now, people may, may want to revisit that and, arg and argue about it or have a conversation about it, uh, but we can do that in July was my anticipation. Mm -hmm. But I think mm -hmm. it would be helpful on that particular topic. I, can, I, I think that issue will pop up again. Let's have uh, a backgrounding memo on that from staff so that people can have the right facts in front of them when we have that conversation. Sure. Mr. Chair, I also would ask, as you're reminding us all, we did have a work group similar to the work group that exists today that provided recommendations. Is there any subject that you would like to go to that work group again this year, which we could do in July and bring back recommendations to? So that, that was helpful the last time. Cap members, that's a broad question. Mr. Chair, Mary Stevens here. Um, Amy, I don't have a response to your question, but I just want to remind the group that, um, you know, there was a lot of time and effort into the decision to do the arterial BRT and then redefine the transit expansion and modernization um, categories. And, you know, I'm inclined to, to agree with staff that to make changes now on a policy basis without any data and having any project come through seems to be premature. So I would just caution us that, you know, I don't want to be sending staff in circles every two years over let's let's let some decisions that we've made play out and see how they work. I guess that's just my feedback. Thanks. Yeah, that's uh, very helpful. Thanks, Mary. Uh, I think that to the extent we've got some um, uh, some record of what we did there. I think we do. The decision that was made by the work group and then eventually by the tab around that $25 million dedication to ABRT, we should provide that to people uh, between this meeting and the next meeting because I think this will come up again as an issue. And Mr. Chair, I would also add that one of the things we added was the spot mobility and safety, um, which I think was really um, uh, I think was a good option to add, and I think we really want to see how that plays out as well a little bit longer. Yeah, thank Member Barber. Good observation. All right, Joe, do you want to keep charging on here? We're over time, but uh, maybe you can get us where we need to be here so that folks can. Uh, I do, and thank uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And there's definitely one more one more slide that we want to make sure people see. Okay. Um, oh. Um, you go back one, I'm sorry. I want to make sure I got that. Mm -hmm. um, no, you're right. Okay, I'm sorry. Skip. Yeah, our next you slide. are okay. All right. Um, so uh, uh, the last item, it's, it's your lengthiest item. It's 35 or 40 pages, if I recall correctly. But it's also not really a particularly um, likely item to change a lot. It's not particularly controversial. Now, it does include eligibility and qualification requirements. For example, we added that ADA 
um, transition plan requirement a couple of years ago. But um, so, but there's not a lot of likelihood of change there. So um, in the qualifying requirements, there's no key changes proposed. You can see those bullets, some of the things that would um, be required to qualify for a project. I'm not gonna rattle those off. Uh, they don't change a lot. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, and then the introductory text, that's where we sort of summarize the, uh, the scoring measures and the funding categories. That's not uh, likely to change a lot. We are going to add that purpose statement that Amy referenced earlier, or maybe I did, uh, to each of those uh, funding categories. Um, and you'll be seeing those uh, next month. Um, and then on page 24, we did have, uh, uh, we do have to track changes that are showing the simplification of the project spacing language. Uh, just uh, to reduce them from three bullets to one, um, but not a, a, a really significant change there. Um, technical committees haven't shown any interest in changing these uh, first 40 pages, sort of the opening chapters. Um, and then in August, you'd be approving the policies, uh, qualifying criteria and project eligibility that you see there. The only other changes I recall uh, tracking in that document are uh, some housekeeping for Safe Routes to School. They changed the terminology of their five E's, six E's, um, but that's about it. Uh, yeah. So next slide. Yeah, I think that'll be the easy part of the conversation, Joe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Go ahead. And um, so this is a uh, a topic that we had planned on bringing next month, and this is the criteria waiting. So this, if you look at each of the uh, um, funding categories uh, outside of unique projects um, along the along the top row, uh, we have. Criteria within each of the criteria are one, two, three, or as many as four scoring measures. But the criteria were set by TAB in the 2014 um, uh, overhaul of the reasons solicitation. It hasn't changed a lot. We had some changes to strategic capacity, uh, not strategic capacity, roadway reconstruction modernization last time. Um, but aside from adding the spot mobility category, it hasn't changed a lot. There's been a few tweaks in the last uh, four cycles, but this shows essentially the relative importance that TAB has put on each of these criteria um, within each of the scoring um, category, funding categories. So uh, this would be the kind of thing where if, if you decided, for example, we want to see equity be worth more in the roadway category or something like that, that we would like to hear about. We actually do say this in the, um, in, uh, it's buried on page four, but in the action item or the info item that by July, Ninth, I believe it was the date that we'd want to hear if there was interest in making changes like that, because that would be a change that would go a little bit. <clears throat> uh, that would be a kind of a big change uh, in terms of history um, and also would require some um, tweaking of maybe the value of scoring measures. Traditionally, each of these was assigned by tab and then the scoring measures within the criteria uh, were uh, were more meted out by um, our technical committees. So this is a lot of table to absorb, I realize. Um, uh, so you should have some time with it. Um, otherwise, I, I and Amy are here for questions. Well, I, I think on the criteria waiting on this table, uh, Joe, I think uh, Elaine, you should send this out to everybody, uh, even though it might be redundant to what they've already received. And then make sure everybody's clear that you want comments on any proposed changes in uh, criteria waiting into you uh, by July 9th, and then you can get it to the appropriate staff people. I can do that. All right, thank you. And we don't have to spend any more time on this today because I think we're, you know, I've pushed the envelope here on folks pretty hard. Mr. Chair? Yes. We might want to consider that given that we're doing some extra work around the, the equity question in our, um, our special uh, set aside group. What modifications do we think we have to do now in this process to um, effectuate some of those ideas vis-a-vis -vis equity specifically, or what flexibility will we have if that can't be determined with that work uh, intersecting with this policy work um, post these decisions? What flexibility would we have to adjust if we discovered from our findings and our other work we would, would actually want to make changes to say a category like equity. Yeah, that's a very good point. So how do we do that, Amy or Elaine? So, uh, Mr. We... Go ahead. Mr. Chair, there are a couple different things going on. Um, 
where the unique projects is discussing how to consider equity and that will likely be in a different way than these projects categories consider equity uh, we also have a project that I need to come before TAB to talk about, which is our equity evaluation of transportation investment, which is just starting up. So to some degree, some of the results of what we're doing and learning are a little bit lagging um, at this point in time to directly be able to say we need to change the equity and housing criteria. Um, but that is not to say that even without those results, we can't put a higher emphasis on it in here. Uh, but I'm just reminding everyone, this whole application will go out for public review uh, in September, if that's correct with Elaine, after the September action of TAB. So we have somewhat limited time to kind of learn from the series of talks and work that we've been doing different from this. Yeah, I thought one of the comments you made, and my memory may be faulty here, was that we may not, that this, in this cycle, we'd be talking about the changes we potentially want to make relative to equity, and it would show up not in the solicitation we're going to work on uh, for 2022, but in the next one. But maybe I was wrong about that. Although I'm not, I'm not adverse to uh, talking about it relative to the 2022 one either. I think that's got to be a choice of the tab. Mr. Chair, another thing I would offer is in July, I think it would be helpful if I or Heidi reviewed with the tab how we have been measuring equity and scoring it currently in the solicitation process so that there's clear understanding of how that's being done today. Um, I think what that's a good idea. Also, I want to point out that the information you're reviewing and making recommendations, as um, Heidi, I mean, Amy mentioned, is this will be going out for public review and comment in September. There's also a chance for the next couple months for any of the TAB members or working with your communities to submit additional comments. Then the final approval would be in November. All right, that's helpful too. You just have a sense of all of a sudden we got compressed into a corner to make some decisions quicker than we normally would have made them. But um, anyway, we'll do the best we can. All right, uh, so I think we got a plan for, um, is that it for you, Joe? Are you finished? So, Mr. Mr. Chair, yes, that should do it for Okay, me. all right. Didn't mean to cut you off if you weren't done. Um, okay, I think we've got a plan here. So we're going to take all this information that staff provided today, and then we've got some presentations I think staff thinks uh, that would be valuable to make, and appropriately so, in July in conjunction with the conversation around all these different uh, topics that are solicitation related. Um, and then we should be able to um, have a real, I think, earnest conversation in July, and then That'll put us in a position where we can probably vote in August. Anybody else have thoughts? I'm looking for hands in the air. Uh, Member Reich, did you have your hand back up in the air? No, I forgot to uh, retract it, sorry. Okay, that's all right. Anyone else? Okay, folks, thanks for hanging in there with us. Um, I probably should have followed Elaine's advice and just taken all the agency reports by uh, by email. We could have saved uh, 20 minutes or so there. But nonetheless, thanks for continuing the participation. I know a lot of people had to get off for other meetings, but are folks comfortable with this methodology we've uh, sort of devised on the fly today? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. Good to know. All right, everybody. Um, I think that's that's it. We will uh, see you in July. If you have anything you want to submit with respect to any of these criteria, make sure you get it in by July 9th to, uh, to Elaine, and then she'll get it to staff. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good fourth. Thank you, Chair. Have